Section 1 of Library of the World's Best Literature, Ancient and Modern, Volume 7. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Library of the World's Best Literature, Ancient and Modern, Volume 7, by various authors. Section 1. Selected Excerpts by Henry Kyler Bunner. Part 1. Henry Kyler Bunner, 1855-1896. The position which Henry Kyler Bunner has come to occupy in the literary annals of our time strengthens as the days pass. If the stream of his genius flowed in gentle rivulets, it traveled as far and spread its fruitful influence as wide as many a statelier river. He was above all things a poet. In his prose, as in his verse, he has revealed the essential qualities of a poet's nature. He dealt with the life which he saw about him in a spirit of broad humanity and with genial sympathy. When he fashioned the tender triolet on the picture of Mignonette, or sang of the little red box at Vesey Street, he wrote of what he knew, and his stories, even when embroidered with quaint fancies, tread firmly the American soil of the nineteenth century. But Bunner's realism never concerned itself with a record of trivialities for their own sake. When he portrayed the lower phases of city life, it was the humor of that life he caught, and not its sordidness, its kindliness, and not its brutality. His mind was healthy, and since it was a poet's mind, the point upon which it was so nicely balanced was love. Love of the trees and flowers, love of his little brothers in wood and field, love of his own country home love of the vast city in its innumerable aspects, above all, love of his wife, his family, and his friends, and all these outgoings of his heart have found touching expression in his verse. Indeed, this attitude of affectionate kinship with the world has colored all his work. It has made his satire sweet-tempered, given his tales their winning grace, and lent to his poetry its abiding power. The work upon which Bunner's fame must rest was all produced within a period of less than fifteen years. He was born in 1855 at Oswego, New York. He came to the city of New York when very young and received his education there. A brief experience of business life sufficed to make his true vocation clear, and at the age of eighteen he began his literary apprenticeship on the Arcadian. When that periodical passed away, Puck was just struggling into existence, and for the English edition which was started in 1877, Bunner's services were secured. Half his short life was spent in editorial connection with that paper. To his wisdom and literary abilities is due in large measure the success which has always attended the enterprise. Bunner had an intimate knowledge of American character and understood the foibles of his countrymen, but he was never cynical, and his satire was without hostility. He despised opportune journalism. His editorials were clear and vigorous, free not from partisanship but from partisan rancor and they made for honesty and independence. His firm stand against political corruption, socialistic vagaries, the misguided and often criminal efforts of labor agitators, and all the visionary schemes of diseased minds, has contributed to the stability of sound and self-respecting American citizenship. Bunner's first decided success in storytelling was The Midge, which appeared in 1886. It is a tale of New York life in the interesting old French quarter of South Fifth Avenue. Again, in the story of a New York house, he displayed the same quick feeling for the spirit of the place. As it was and is, 
the tale first appeared in the newly founded Scribner's Magazine, to which he has since been a constant contributor. Here, some of his best short stories have been published, including the excellent Zadok Pine, with its healthy presentation of independent manhood in contest with the oppressive exactions of labor organizations. But Bunner was no believer in stories with a tendency, the conditions which lie at the root of great sociological questions, he used as artistic material, never as texts. His stories are distinguished by simplicity of motive, each is related with fine unobtrusive humor, and with an underlying pathos, never unduly emphasized. The most popular of his collections of tales is that entitled Short Sixes, which, having first appeared in Puck, were published in book form in 1891. A second volume came out three years later, when the shadow of death had already fallen upon Bunner. A new collection of his sketches was in process of publication, Jersey Street and Jersey Lane. In these, as in the still more recent Suburban Sage, is revealed the same fineness of sympathetic observation in town and country that we have come to associate with Bunner's name. Among his prose writings, there remains to be mentioned the series from Puck entitled Made in France. These are an application of the methods of Maupassant to American subjects. They display that wonderful facility in reproducing the flavor of another style which is exhibited in Bunner's verse in a still more eminent degree. His prose style never attained the perfection of literary finish, but it is an easy and direct, free from sentimentality and rhetoric, in the simplicity of his conceptions and the delicacy of his treatment lies its chief charm. Bunner's verse, on the other hand, shows a complete mastery of form. He was a close student of Horace. He tried successfully the most exacting of exotic verse forms, and enjoyed the distinction of having written the only English example of the difficult chant royale. Graceful vers de société and bits of witty epigram flowed from him without effort. But it was not to this often dangerous facility that Bunner owed his poetic fame. His tenderness, his quick sympathy with nature, his insight into the human heart, and above all, the love and longing that filled his soul, have infused into his perfected rhythms the spirit of universal brotherhood that underlies all genuine poetry. His Airs from Arcady, 1884, achieved a success unusual for a volume of poems, and the love lyrics and patriotic songs of his later volume, Rowan, maintained the high level of the earlier book. The great mass of his poems is still buried in the back numbers of the magazines from which the best are to be rescued in a new volume. If his place is not among the greatest of our time, he has produced a sufficient body of fine verse to rescue his name from oblivion and render his memory dear to all who value the legacy of a sincere and genuine poet. He died on May 11th, 1896, at the age of 41. Triolet A picture of mignonette in a tenement's highest casement Queer sort of flower pot yet, that pitcher of mignonette, is a garden in heaven set to the little sick child in the basement. The pitcher of mignonette in the tenement's highest casement. Copyrighted by Charles Scribner's Sons. The Love Letters of Smith from Short Sixes. When the little seamstress had climbed to her room in the story over the top story of the great brick tenement house in which she lived, she was quite tired out. If you do not understand what a story over a top story is, you must remember that there are no limits to human greed and hardly any to the height of tenement houses. When the man who owned that seven-story tenement found that he could rent another floor... He found no difficulty in persuading the guardians of our building laws to let him clap another story on the roof, 
like a cabin on the deck of a ship, and in the southeasterly of the four apartments on this floor the little seamstress lived. You can just see the top of her window from the street, the huge cornice that had capped the original front and that served as her window sill now, quite hid all the lower part of the story on top of the top story. The little seamstress was scarcely thirty years old, but she was such an old-fashioned little body in so many of her looks and ways that I had almost spelled her seamstress after the fashion of our grandmothers. She had been a comely body, too, and would have been still if she had not been thin and pale and anxious-eyed. She was tired out tonight because she had been working hard all day for a lady who lived far up in the new wards beyond Harlem River, and after the long journey home she had to climb seven flights of tenement house stairs. She was too tired, both in body and in mind, to cook the two little chops she had brought home. She would save them for breakfast, she thought. So she made herself a cup of tea on the miniature stove and ate a slice of dry bread with it. It was too much trouble to make toast. But after dinner she watered her flowers. She was never too tired for that. And the six pots of geraniums that caught the south sun on the top of the cornice did their best to repay her. And then she sat down in her rocking chair by the window and looked out. Her eyrie was high above all the other buildings, and she could look across some low roofs opposite and see the further end of Tompkins Square, with its sparse spring green showing faintly through the dusk. The eternal roar of the city floated up to her and vaguely troubled her. She was a country girl, and although she had lived for ten years in New York, she had never grown used to that ceaseless murmur. Tonight she felt the languor of the new season, as well as the heaviness of physical exhaustion. She was almost too tired to go to bed. She thought of the hard day done and the hard day to begun after the night spent on the hard little bed. She thought of the peaceful days in the country when she taught school in the Massachusetts village where she was born. She thought of a hundred small slights that she had to bear from people better fed than bread. She thought of the sweet green fields that she rarely saw nowadays. She thought of the long journey forth and back that must begin and end her morrow's work. And she wondered if her employer would think to offer to pay her fare. Then she pulled herself together. She must think of more agreeable things or she could not sleep. And as the only agreeable things she had to think about were her flowers, she looked at the garden on top of the cornice. A peculiar gritting noise made her look down, and she saw a cylindrical object that glittered in the twilight, advancing in an irregular and uncertain manner toward her flower pots. Looking closer, she saw that it was a pewter beer mug, which somebody in the next apartment was pushing with a two-foot rule. On top of the beer mug was a piece of paper, and on this paper was written, in a sprawling, half-formed hand, Porter, please excuse the liberty and drink it. The seamstress started up in terror and shut the window. She remembered that there was a man in the next apartment. She had seen him on the stairs on Sundays. He seemed a grave, decent person, but he must be drunk. She sat down on her bed all a-tremble, and then she reasoned with herself. The man was drunk, that was all. He probably would not annoy her further. And if he did, she had only to retreat to Mrs. Mulvaney's apartment in the rear, and Mr. Mulvaney, who was a highly respectable man and worked in a boiler shop, would protect her. So being a poor woman who had already had occasion to excuse and refuse, two or three liberties of like sort, she made up her mind to go to bed like a reasonable seamstress, and she did. She was rewarded for when her light was out. She could see in the moonlight that the two-foot rule appeared again with one joint bent back, 
hitched itself into the mug handle and withdrew the mug. The next day was a hard one for the little seamstress, and she hardly thought of the affair of the night before, until the same hour had come around again, and she sat once more by her window, and then she smiled at the remembrance. Poor fellow, she said in her charitable heart, I've no doubt he's awfully ashamed of it now. Perhaps he was never tipsy before. Perhaps he didn't know there was a lone woman in here to be frightened. And just then she heard a gritting sound. She looked down. The pewter pot was in front of her, and the two-foot rule was slowly retiring. On the pot was a piece of paper, and on the paper was... Porter. Good for the health. It makes meat. This time the little seamstress shut her window with a bang of indignation. The color rose to her pale cheeks. She thought that she would go down to see the janitor at once. And then she remembered the seven flights of stairs, and she resolved to see the janitor in the morning. And then she went to bed and saw the mug drawn back just as it had been drawn back the night before. The morning came. But somehow the seamstress did not care to complain to the janitor. She hated to make trouble, and the janitor might think, and, 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 well, if the wretch did it again, she would speak to him herself, and that would settle it. And so on the next night, which was a Thursday, the little seamstress sat down by her window, resolved to settle the matter. And she had not sat there long, rocking in the creaking little rocking chair which she had brought with her from her old home, when the pewter pot hove in sight with a piece of paper on the top. This time the legend read, Perhaps you are afraid I will address you. I am not that kind. The seamstress did not quite know whether to laugh or to cry, but she felt that the time had come for speech. She leaned out of her window and addressed the twilight heaven. Mr. Uh, Mr. Sir, I will you please put your head out of the window so that I can speak to you? The silence of the other room was undisturbed. The seamstress drew back, blushing. But before she could nerve herself for another attack, a piece of paper appeared on the end of the two-foot rule. When I say a thing, I mean it. I have said I would not address you, and I will not. What was the little seamstress to do? She stood by the window and thought hard about it. Should she complain to the janitor? But the creature was perfectly respectful. No doubt he meant to be kind. He certainly was kind to waste these pots of porter on her. She remembered the last time, and the first, that she had drunk porter. It was at home, when she was a young girl, after she had had the diphtheria. She remembered how good it was, and how it had given her back her strength, and without one thought of what she was doing, she lifted the pot of porter and took one little reminiscent sip, two little reminiscent sips, and became aware of her utter fall and defeat. She blushed now, as she had never blushed before, put the pot down, closed the window, and fled to her bed like a deer to the woods. And when the porter arrived the next night, bearing the simple appeal, Don't be afraid of it. Drink it all. The little seamstress arose and grasped the pot firmly by the handle and poured its contents over the earth around her largest geranium. She poured the contents out to the last drop, and then she dropped the pot and ran back and sat on her bed and cried with her face hid in her hands. Now, she said to herself, you've done it, and you're just as nasty and hard-hearted and suspicious and mean as, as Palsley. And she wept to think of her hardness of heart. He will never give me a chance to say I am sorry, she thought. And really, she might have spoken kindly to the poor man and told him that she was much obliged to him, but that he really must not ask her to drink porter with him. But it's all over and done now, she said to herself, as she sat at her window on Saturday night. And then she looked at the cornice 
and saw the faithful little pewter pot traveling slowly toward her. She was conquered. This act of Christian forbearance was too much for her kindly spirit. She read the inscription on the paper. Porter is good for flowers, but better for folks. And she lifted the pot to her lips, which were not half so red as her cheeks, and took a good, hearty, grateful draught. She sipped in thoughtful silence after this first plunge, and presently she was surprised to find the bottom of the pot in full view. On the table at her side a few pearl buttons were screwed up in a bit of white paper. She untwisted the paper and smoothed it out, and wrote in a tremulous hand. She could write a very neat hand. Thanks. This she laid on the top of the pot, and in a moment the bent two-foot rule appeared and drew the mail carriage home and then she sat still, enjoying the warm glow of the porter, which seemed to have permeated her entire being with a heat that was not at all like the unpleasant and oppressive heat of the atmosphere, an atmosphere heavy with a spring damp. A gritting on the tin aroused her. A piece of paper lay under her eyes. Fine growing weather, Smith. Now it is unlikely that in the whole round and range of conversational commonplaces there was one other greeting that could have induced the seamstress to continue the exchange of communications. But this simple and homely phrase touched her country heart. What did growing weather matter to the toilers in this waste of brick and mortar? This stranger must be like herself, a country-bred soul, longing for the new green and the upturned brown mold of the country fields. She took up the paper and wrote under the first message, Fine. But that seemed curt, for she added, For what? She did not know. At last, in desperation, she put down potatoes. The piece of paper was withdrawn and came back with an addition. Two missed for potatoes. And when the little seamstress had read this and grasped the fact that mist, M-I-S-T, represented the writer's pronunciation of moist, she laughed softly to herself. A man whose mind at such a time was seriously bent upon potatoes was not a man to be feared. She found a half sheet of note paper and wrote, I lived in a small village before I came to New York, but I am afraid I do not know much about farming. Are you a farmer? The answer came. Have been most everything. Farmed a spell in Maine, Smith. As she read this, the seamstress heard the church clock strike nine. Bless me! Is it so late? she cried, and she hurriedly penciled, Good night, thrust the paper out, and closed the window. But a few minutes later, Passing by, she saw yet another bit of paper on the cornice fluttering in the evening breeze. It said only, Good night. And after a moment's hesitation, the little seamstress took it in and gave it shelter. After this, they were the best of friends. Every evening the pot appeared, and while the seamstress drank from it at her window, Mr. Smith drank from its twin at his and notes were exchanged as rapidly as Mr. Smith's early education permitted. They told each other their histories, and Mr. Smith's was one of travel and variety, which he seemed to consider quite a matter of course. He had followed the sea, he had farmed, he had been a logger and a hunter in the Maine woods. Now he was a foreman of an East River lumber yard, and he was prospering. In a year or two he would have enough laid by to go home to Bucksport and buy a share in a shipbuilding business. All this dribbled out in the course of a jerky but variegated correspondence, in which autobiographic details were mixed with reflections moral and philosophical. A few samples will give an idea of Mr. Smith's style. I was one trip to Van Diemen's land, to which the seamstress replied, It must have been very interesting. But Mr. Smith disposed of this subject very briefly. 
It weren't. Further, he vouchsafed. I seen a Chinese cook in Hong Kong could cook flapjacks like your mother. A missionary that sells rum is the meanest of God's creatures. A bullfight is not what it is cracked up to be. The dagos are worse'n the brutes. I am six one and three quarters, but my father was six foot four. The seamstress had taught school one winter, and she could not refrain from making an attempt to reform Mr. Smith's orthography. One evening, in answer to this communications, I killed a bear in Maine, six hundred pounds weight, she wrote. Isn't it generally spelled B-E-A-R? But she gave up the attempt when he responded, A bear's a mean animal any way you spell him. The spring wore on, and the summer came, and still the evening drink and the evening correspondence brightened the close of each day for the little seamstress, and the draught of porter put her to sleep each night, giving her a calmer rest than she had ever known during her stay in the noisy city, and it began moreover to make a little meat for her, and then the thought that she was going to have an hour of pleasant companionship somehow gave her courage to cook and eat her little dinner, however tired she was. The seamstress's cheeks began to blossom with the June roses. And all this time Mr. Smith kept his vow of silence unbroken, though the seamstress sometimes tempted him with little ejaculations and exclamations to which he might have responded. He was silent and invisible, only the smoke of his pipe and the clink of his mug as he set it down on the cornice told her that a living, material smith was her correspondent. They never met on the stairs, for their hours of coming and going did not coincide. Once or twice they passed each other in the street, but Mr. Smith looked straight ahead of him, about a foot over her head, the little seamstress thought he was a very fine-looking man, with his six feet one and three quarters, and his thick brown beard. Most people would have called him plain. Once she spoke to him. She was coming home one summer evening, and a gang of corner loafers stopped her and demanded money to buy beer, as is their custom. Before she had time to be frightened, Mr. Smith appeared, whence she knew not, scattered the gang like chaff, and collaring two of the human hyenas, kicked them with deliberate, ponderous, alternate kicks, until they writhed in ineffable agony when he let them crawl away. She turned to him and thanked him warmly, looking very pretty now with a color in her cheeks, but Mr. Smith answered no word. He stared over her head, grew red in the face, fidgeted nervously, but held his peace until his eyes fell on a rotund Teuton passing by. "'Say, Dutchie!' he roared. The German stood aghast. "'I ain't got nothing to write with!' thundered Mr. Smith, looking him in the eye, and then the man of his word passed on his way. And so the summer went on and the two correspondents chatted silently from window to window, hid from sight of all the world below by the friendly cornice. And they looked out over the roof and saw the green of Tompkins Square grow darker and dustier as the months went on. Mr. Smith was given to Sunday trips into the suburbs, and he never came back without a bunch of daisies or black-eyed Susans or later asters or goldenrod for the little seamstress. Sometimes with a sagacity rare in his sex, he brought her a whole plant with fresh loam for potting. He gave her also a reel in a bottle which he wrote he had made himself, and some coral and a dried flying fish that was something fearful to look upon with its sword-like fins and its hollow eyes. At first she could not go to sleep with that flying fish hanging on the wall. But he surprised the little seamstress very much one cool September evening when he shoved this letter along the cornice. 
Respected and honored madam, having long and vainly sought an opportunity to convey to you the expression of my sentiments, I now avail myself of the privilege of epistolary communication to acquaint you with the fact that the emotions which you have raised in my breast are those which should point to connubial love and affection rather than to simple friendship. In short, madam, I have the honor to approach you with a proposal, the acceptance of which will fill me with ecstatic gratitude and enable me to extend to you those protecting cares which the matrimonial bond makes at once the duty and privilege of him who would at no distant date lead you to the hymeneal altar, one whose charms and virtues should suffice to kindle its flames without extraneous aid. I remain, dear madam, your humble servant and ardent adorer, J. Smith. The little seamstress gazed at this letter a long time. Perhaps she was wondering in what ready letter writer of the last century Mr. Smith had found his form. Perhaps she was amused at the results of his first attempt at punctuation. Perhaps she was thinking of something else, for there were tears in her eyes and a smile on her small mouth. But it must have been a long time, and Mr. Smith must have grown nervous, for presently another communication came along the line where the top of the cornice was worn smooth. It read, If not understood, will you marry me? The little seamstress seized a piece of paper and wrote, If I say yes, will you speak to me? And then she rose and passed it out to him, leaning out of the window, and their faces met. Copyright of Kepler and Schwartzman. End of section one. Section two of Library of the World's Best Literature, Ancient and Modern, Volume seven. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Leonard Wolfson of Springfield, Ohio. Library of the World's Best Literature, Ancient and Modern, Volume 7, by Various Authors, Section 2, Selected Excerpts by Henry Kyler Bunner. Part Two. The Way to Arcady Oh, what's the way to Arcady, to Arcady, to Arcady? Oh, what's the way to Arcady, where all the leaves are merry? Oh, what's the way to Arcady? The spring is rustling in the tree, the tree the wind is blowing through. It sets the blossoms flickering white. I knew not skies could burn so blue nor any breezes blow so light. They blow an old-time way for me across the world to Arcady. Oh, what's the way to Arcady? Sir Poet with the rusty coat, quit mocking of the songbird's note. How have you heart for any tune, you with the way-worn russet shoon? Your scrip was swinging by your side, Gapes with gaunt mouth hungry wide. I'll brim it well with pieces red, If you will tell the way to tread. Oh, I am bound for Arcady, And if you but keep pace with me, You tread the way to Arcady. And where away lies Arcady, And how long yet may the journey be? Ah, uh, that, quoth he, I do not know, across the clover and the snow, across the forest, across the flowers, through summer seconds and winter hours, I've trod the way my whole life long, and know not now where it may be. My guide is but the stir to song, that tells me I cannot go wrong, 
or clear or dark the pathway be upon the road to arcady but how shall i do who cannot sing i was wont to sing once on a time there is never an echo now to ring remembrance back to the trick of rhyme tis strange you cannot sing quoth he the folk all sing in arcady but how may he find arcady who hath nor youth nor melody what know you not old man quoth he your hair is white your face is wise that love must kiss that mortal's eyes who hopes to see fair arcady no gold can buy you entrance there but beggared love may go all bare no wisdom one with weariness but love goes in with folly's stress no fame that wit could ever win but only love may lead love in to arcady to arcady ah woe is me through all my days wisdom and wealth i both have got and fame and name and great men's praise but love ah love i have it not there was a time when life was new but far away and half forgot i only know her eyes were blue but love i fear i knew it not we did not wed for lack of gold and she is dead and i am old all things have come since then to me save love ah love and arcady ah then i fear we part quoth he my way is for love and arcady but you you fare alone like me the gray is likewise in your hair what love have you to lead you there to arcady to arcady ah no not lonely do i fare my true companion's memory with love he fills the springtime air with love he clothes the winter tree oh past this poor horizon's bound my song goes straight to one who stands her face all gladdening at the sound to lead me to the spring green lands to wander with enlacing hands the songs within my breast that stir are all of her are all of her my maid is dead long years quoth he she waits for me in arcady oh yon's the way to arcady to arcady to arcady oh yon's the way to arcady where all the leaves are merry chant royal i would that all men my hard case might know how grievously i suffer for no sin i adolph culpepper ferguson for lo i of my landlady am locked in for being short on this sad saturday nor having shekels of silver wherewith to pay she has turned and is departed with my key wherefore not even as other boarders free i sing as prisoners to their dungeon stones when for ten days they expiate a spree behold the deeds that are done of mrs jones one night and one day have i wept my woe nor wot i when the morrow doth begin if i shall have to write to briggs and co to pray them to advance the requisite ten for ransom of their salesmen that he may go forth as other boarders go alway as those i hear now flocking from their tea led by the daughter of my landlady piano word this day for all my moans dry bread and water have been served me behold the deeds that are done of mrs jones miss amabel jones is musical and so the heart of the young he boarder doth win playing the maiden's prayer adagio that fetcheth him 
as fetcheth the back o skin the innocent rustic for my part i pray that Badarjevska maid may wait for a ere sit she with a lover as did we once sit together amabel can it be that all that arduous wooing not atones for saturday shortness of trade dollars three behold the deeds that are done of mrs jones yea she forgets the arm was wont to go round her waist she wears a buckle whose pin galleth the crook of the young man's elbow i forget not for i that youth have been smith was aforetime the lothario gay yet once i mind me smith was forced to stay close in his room not calm as i was he but his noise brought no pleasance verily small ease he got a playing on the bones or hammering on his stovepipe that i see behold the deeds that are done of mrs jones thou for whose fear the figurative crow i eat accursed be thou and all thy kin thee will i show up yea up will i show thy too thick buckwheats and thy tea too thin ay here i dare thee ready for the fray thou dost not keep a first-class house i say it does not with the advertisements agree thou lodgest a briton with a puggery and thou hast harboured jacobses and cones also a mulligan thus denounce i thee behold the deeds that are done of mrs jones envoy orders the worst i have not told to ye she has stolen my trousers that i may not flee privily by the window hence these groans there is no fleeing in a robe de nuit behold the deeds that are done of mrs jones End of section two recording by leonard wilson of springfield ohio section three of library of the world's best literature ancient and modern volume seven this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox dot org library of the world's best literature ancient and modern volume seven by various authors section three biographical note on john bunyan sixteen twenty eight to sixteen eighty eight by the reverend edwin p parker john bunyan son of thomas bunyan jr and margaret bentley was born in sixteen twenty eight in the quaint old village of elstow one mile southwest of bedford near the spot where three hundred years before his ancestor william boynan resided his father was a poor tinker or brazier and his mother's lineage is unknown he says i never went to school to aristotle or plato but was brought up at my father's house in a very mean condition among a company of poor countrymen he learned to read and write according to the rate of other poor men's children but soon lost almost utterly the little he had learned shortly after his mother's death when he was about seventeen years of age he served as a soldier for several months probably in the parliamentary army not long afterwards he married a woman as poor as himself by whose gentle influence he was gradually led into the way of those severe spiritual conflicts and painful exercises of mind from which he finally came forth at great cost victorious these religious experiences vividly described in his grace abounding traceable in the course of his chief pilgrim and frequently referred to in his discourses have been too literally interpreted by some 
and too much explained away as unreal by others, but present no special difficulty to those who will but consider Bunyan's own explanations. From boyhood he had lived a roving and non-religious life, although possessing no little tenderness of conscience. He was neither intemperate nor dishonest. He was not a lawbreaker. He explicitly and indignantly declares, if all the fornicators and adulterers in England were hanged by the neck till they be dead, John Bunyan would still be alive and well. The particular sins of which he was guilty, so far as he specifies them, were profane swearing, from which he suddenly ceased at a woman's reproof, and certain sports, innocent enough in themselves, which the prevailing Puritan rigor severely condemned. What then of that vague and exceeding sinfulness of which he so bitterly accuses and repents himself? It was that vision of sin, however, disproportionate, which a deeply wounded and graciously healed spirit often has in looking back upon the past from that theological standpoint whence all want of conformity to the perfect law of God seems heinous and dreadful. A sinner may be comparatively a little sinner and sensibly a great one. There are two sorts of greatness in sin. Greatness by reason of number greatness by reason of the horrible nature of sin. In the last sense, he that has but one sin, if such an one could be found, may in his own eyes find himself the biggest sinner in the world. Visions of God break the heart, because by the sight the soul then has of his perfections, it sees its own infinite and unspeakable disproportion. The best saints are most sensible of their sins, and most apt to make mountains of their molehills. Such sentences from Bunyan's own writings, and many like them might be quoted, shed more light upon the much debated question of his wickedness than all that his biographers have written. In John Gifford, pastor of a little free church in Bedford, Bunyan found a wise friend and in 1653 he joined that church. He soon discovered his gifts among the brethren, and in due time was appointed to the office of a gospel minister in which he labored with indefatigable industry and zeal, and with ever-increasing fame and success until his death. His hard personal fortunes between the restoration of 1660 and the Declaration of Indulgence of 1672, including his imprisonment for twelve years in Bedford Jail, his subsequent imprisonment in 1675 to 76, when the first part of the Pilgrim's Progress was probably written, and the arduous engagements of his later and comparatively peaceful years must be sought in biographies the latest and perhaps the best of which is that by Rev. John Brown, minister of the Bunyan Church at Bedford. The statute under which Bunyan suffered is the 35th Elis Cap 1, re-enacted with rigor in the 16th Charles II Cap 4, 1662, and the spirit of it appears in the indictment preferred against him that he devilishly and perniciously abstain from coming to church to hear divine service and is a common upholder of several unlawful meetings and conventicles to the great disturbance and distraction of the good subjects of this kingdom, etc., etc. The story of Bunyan's life up to the time of his imprisonment, and particularly that of his arrests and examinations before the justices, and also the account of his experiences in prison, should be read in his own most graphic narrative in The Grace Abounding, which is one of the most precious portions of all autobiographic literature. Bunyan was born and bred, he lived and labored among the common people, with whom his sympathies were strong and tender, and by whom he was regarded with the utmost veneration and affection. He understood them, and they him. For nearly a century they were almost the only readers of his published writings. 
they came to call him Bishop Bunyan. His native genius, his great human-heartedness and loving kindness, his burning zeal and indomitable courage, his racy humor and kindling imagination, all vitalized by the spiritual force which came upon him through the encompassing atmosphere of devout Puritanism, were consecrated to the welfare of his fellow men. His personal friend, Mr. Doe, describes him as tall in stature, strong-boned, of a ruddy face, with sparkling eyes, nose well set, mouth moderately large, forehead something high, and his habit always plain and modest. His portrait, painted in 1685, shows a vigorous, kindly face, with mustachios and imperial and abundance of hair falling in long, wavy masses about the neck and shoulders, more cavalier-like than round-head. Bunyan was a voluminous writer, and his works, many of them posthumous, are said to equal in number the sixty years of his life. But even the devout and sympathetic critic is compelled to acknowledge the justice of that verdict of time which has consigned most of them to a virtual oblivion. The controversial tracts possess no elements of enduring interest. The doctrinal and spiritual discourses are elaborations of a system of religious thought which long ago had its day and ceased to be. And yet they contain pithy sentences homely and pat illustrations, and many a paragraph, rugged or tender, in which one recognizes the stamp of his genius and an intimation of his remarkable power as a preacher. The best of these discourses, the Jerusalem sinner saved, come and welcome to Jesus Christ, and light for them that sit in darkness, while they sparkle here and there with things, unique and precious to the Bunyan curious student, would seem dull and tedious to the general, though devout reader. In many a passage we feel, to use his phrase, his heart-pulling power, no less than the force and felicity of his most original images and analogies. But these passages are little oases in a dry and thirsty land. The life and death of Mr. Badman vividly presents certain aspects of English provincial life in that day, but they are repulsive, and the entire work is marred by flat moralizings and coarse, often incredible stories. The Holy War, which Macaulay said would have been our greatest religious allegory if The Pilgrim's Progress had not been written, has ceased to be much read. The conception of the conquest of the human soul by the irresistible operation of divine force is so foreign to modern thought and faith that Bunyan's similitude no longer seems a very similitude. The pages abound with quaint, humorous, and lifelike touches, as where Diabolus stations at Eargate a guard of deaf men under old Mr. Prejudice and unbelief is described as a nimble jack whom they could never lay hold of. But as compared with the pilgrim's progress, the allegory is artificial. Its elaboration of analogies is ponderous and tedious, and its characters lack solidity and reality. All these works, however, exhibit a remarkable command of the mother tongue, a shrewd common sense and mother wit, a fervid spiritual life, and a wonderful knowledge of the English Bible. They may be likened to more or less submerged wrecks kept from sinking into utter neglect by the bond of authorship which connects them with the one incomparable work which floats, unimpaired by time, on the sea of universal appreciation and favor. Bunyan's unique and secure position in English literature was gained by the Pilgrim's Progress, the first part of which was published in 1678, and the second in 1685. The broader, freer conception of the pilgrimage, as old in literature as the 90th Psalm, apt and fond as innumerable books show, from de Gaulville's Le Pèlerinage de l'Homme, in the 14th century to Patrick's Parable, 300 years later, 
took sudden possession of Bunyan's imagination while he was in prison, and kindled all his finest powers. Then he undertook, poet-wise, to work out this conception, capable of such diversity of illustration in a form of literature that has ever been especially congenial to the human mind. Unguided, save by his own consecrated genius, unaided by other books than his English Bible and Fox's Book of Martyrs, he proceeded with a simplicity of purpose and felicity of expression, and with a fidelity to nature and life, which gave to his unconsciously artistic story the charm of perfect artlessness as well as the semblance of reality. When Bunyan's lack of learning and culture are considered, and also the comparative dryness of his controversial and didactic writings, this efflorescence of a vital spirit of beauty and of an essentially poetic genius in him seems quite inexplicable. The author's rhymed apology for his book, which usually prefaces The Pilgrim's Progress, contains many significant hints as to the way in which he was led to make truth spangle and its rays to shine. He had no thought of producing a work of literary excellence, but on the other hand he had not in writing this book his customary purpose of spiritual edification. Indeed, he put his multiplying thoughts and fancies aside, lest they should interfere with a more serious and important book which he had in hand. I only thought to make I knew not what, nor did I undertake thereby to please my neighbor. No, not I, I did it mine own self to gratify. And thus I set pen to paper with delight, and quickly had my thoughts in black and white. The words are exceedingly suggestive. In writing so aimlessly, I knew not what. To gratify himself by permitting the allegory into which he had suddenly fallen to take possession of him and carry him whithersoever it would, while he wrote out with delight his teeming fancies, was not Bunyan for the first time exercising his genius in a freedom from all theological and other restraint? and so in a surpassing range and power. The dreamer and poet supplanted the preacher and teacher. He yielded to the simple impulse of his genius, gave his imagination full sweep, and so as never before or elsewhere, soared and sang in what seemed to many of his Puritan friends a questionable freedom and profane inspiration. And yet, his song or story was not a creation of mere fancy. It came from my own heart, so to my head, and thence into my fingers trickled. And therefore, we add, it finds its way to the heart of mankind. Hence the spontaneity of the allegory, its ease and freedom of movement, its unlabored development, its natural and vital enfolding of that old pilgrim idea of human life which had so often bloomed in the literature of all climes and ages, but whose consummate flower appeared in the book of this inspired Puritan tinker-preacher. Hence also the dramatic unity and methodic perfectness of the story. Its byways all lead to its highway, its episodes are as vitally related to the main theme as are the ramifications of a tree to its central stem. The great diversities of experience in the true pilgrims are dominated by one supreme motive. As for the others, they appear incidentally to complete the scenes and to make the world and its life manifold and real. The pilgrim is a most substantial person, and once well on the way, the characters he meets, the difficulties he encounters, the succor he receives, the scenes in which he mingles, are all, however surprising, most natural. The names, and one might almost say the forms and faces, of pliable, obstinate, faithful, hopeful, talkative, mercy, great heart, old honest, valiant for truth, feeble mind, ready to halt, 
Miss Much Afraid, and many another are familiar to us all. Indeed, the pilgrimage is our own, in many of its phases at least, and we have met the people whom Bunyan saw in his dream, and are ourselves they whom he describes. When Dean Stanley began his course of lectures on ecclesiastical history at Oxford, his opening words were those of the passage where the pilgrim is taken to the house beautiful to see the rarities and histories of that place, both ancient and modern, and at the end of the same course, wishing to sketch the prospects of Christendom, he quoted the words in which on leaving the house beautiful, Christian was shown the distant view of the delectable mountains. But for one glance at Pope and Pagan, there is almost nothing to indicate the writer's ecclesiastical standing. But for here and there, a marking of time in prosaic passages which have nothing to do with the story, there is nothing to mar the Catholicity of its spirit. Romanists and Protestants, Anglicans and Puritans, Calvinists and Armenians, all communions and sects, have edited and circulated it. It is the completest triumph of truth by fiction in all literature. More than any other human book, it is a religious bond to the whole of English Christendom. The second part is perhaps inferior to the first, but is richer in incident, and some of its characters, mercy, old honest, valiant for truth and great heart, for instance, are exquisitely conceived and presented. Here again the reader will do well to carefully peruse the author's rhymed introduction. When Christian left locked up and went his way, sweet Christiana opens with her key. Go then, my little book, he says, and tell young damsels of mercy and old men of plain-hearted old honest. Tell people of Master Fearing, who was a good man, though much down in spirit. Tell them of feeble mind and ready to halt, and Master Despondency and his daughter, who softly went but sure. When thou hast told the world of all these things, then turn about my book and touch these strings, which, if but touched, will such a music make. They'll make a cripple dance, a giant quake. This second part introduces some new scenes as well as characters and experiences, but with the same broad sympathy and humor. And there are closing descriptions not excelled in power and pathos by anything in the earlier pilgrimage. In his apology, Bunyan says, This book is writ in such a dialect as may the minds of listless men affect. The idiom of the book is purely English, acquired by a diligent study of the English Bible. It is the simplest, raciest, and most sinewy English to be found in any writer of our language, and Bunyan's amazing use of this Saxon idiom for all the purposes of his story, and the range and freedom of his imaginative genius therein, like certain of Tennyson's idylls show it to be an instrument of symphonic capacity and variety. Bunyan's own maxim is a good one. Words easy to be understood do often hit the mark, when high and learned ones do only pierce the air. Of the pilgrim's progress in both its parts, we may say in the words of Milton, these are the works that could not be composed by the invocation of Dame Memory and her siren daughters, but by devout prayer to that eternal spirit who can enrich with all utterance and knowledge and send out his seraphim with a hallowed fire of his altar to touch and purify the lips of whom he pleases, without reference to station, birth, or education. Let Bunyan speak for his own book. Wouldst thou be in a dream and yet not sleep? Or wouldst thou in a moment laugh and weep? Wouldst thou lose thyself and catch no harm, and find thyself again without a charm? Wouldst read thyself, and read thou knowest not what, and yet know whether thou art blessed or not by reading the same lines? 
O oh, then come hither, and lay my book, thy head and heart together. Bunyan died of fever in the house of a friend at London, August 12th, 1688, in the sixty-first year of his age. Three of his four children survived him. The blind daughter, for whom he expressed such affectionate solicitude during his imprisonment, died before him. His second wife, Elizabeth, who pleaded for him with so much dignity and feeling before Judge Hale and other justices, died in 1692. In 1862, a recumbent statue was placed on his tomb in Bunhill Fields, and thirteen years later a noble statue was erected in his honor at Bedford. The church at Elstow is enriched with memorial windows presenting scenes from the Holy War and the Pilgrim's Progress and the Bunyan Meeting House in Bedford has bronze doors presenting similar scenes. The great allegory has been translated into almost every language and dialect under the sun. The successive editions of it are almost innumerable, and no other book save the Bible has had an equally large circulation. The verdict of approval stamped upon it at first by the common people has been fully recognized and accepted by the learned and cultivated. End of section three. Section four of Library of the World's Best Literature, Ancient and Modern, Volume seven. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Tony Addison. The Library of the World's Best Literature, Ancient and Modern, Volume 7, by various authors. Section 4. Selected Excerpts from the Pilgrim's Progress by John Bunyan. Part 1. The Fight with Apollyon But now, in this valley of humiliation, poor Christian was hard put to it, for he had gone but a little way, before he espied a foul fiend coming over the field to meet him. His name is Apollyon. Then did Christian begin to be afraid, and to cast in his mind whether to go back or to stand his ground. But he considered again that he had no armour for his back, and therefore thought that to turn the back to him might give him the greater advantage with ease to pierce him with his darts. Therefore he resolved to venture and stand his ground, for, thought he, had I no more in mine eye than the saving of my life, t'would be the best way to stand. So he went on, and Apollyon met him. Now the monster was hideous to behold. He was clothed with scales like a fish, and they are his pride. He had wings like a dragon, feet like a bear, and out of his belly came fire and smoke, and his mouth was as the mouth of a lion. When he was come up to Christian, he beheld him with a disdainful countenance, and thus began to question with him. Apollyon, whence come you, and whither are you bound? Christian, I am come from the city of destruction, which is the place of all evil, and am going to the city of Zion. Apollyon, by this I perceive thou art one of my subjects, for all that country is mine, and I am the prince and god of it. How is it, then, that thou hast run away from thy king? Were it not that I hope thou mayest do me more service, 
I would strike thee now at one blow to the ground. Christian, I was born indeed in your dominions, but your service was hard, and your wages such as a man could not live on, for the wages of sin is death. Therefore, when I was come to years, I did as other considerate persons do, look out, if perhaps I might mend myself. Apollyon, there is no prince that will thus lightly lose his subjects, neither will I as yet lose thee. But since thou complainest of thy service and wages, be content to go back. What our country will afford, I do here promise to give thee. Christian, but I have let myself to another, even to the king of princes, and how can I with fairness go back with thee? Apollyon, thou hast done in this, according to the proverb, changed a bad for a worse. But it is ordinary for those that have professed themselves his servants, after a while to give him the slip, and return again to me. Do thou so too, and all shall be well. Christian, I have given him my faith, and sworn my allegiance to him. How then can I go back from this, and not be hanged as a traitor? Apollyon, thou didst the same to me, and yet I am willing to pass by all, if now thou wilt yet turn again, and go back. Christian, what I promised thee was in my nonage, and, besides, I count that the prince under whose banner now I stand is able to absolve me, yea, and to pardon also what I did as to my compliance with thee. And besides, O thou destroying Apollyon to speak truth, I like his service, his wages, his servants, his government, his company and country better than thine. And therefore leave off to persuade me further. I am his servant, and I will follow him. Apollyon Consider again, when thou art in cool blood, of what thou art like to meet with in the way that thou goest. Thou knowest that for the most part his servants come to an ill end, because they are transgressors against me and my ways. How many of them have been put to shameful death? And besides, thou countest his service better than mine, whereas he never came yet from the place where he is to deliver any that served him out of our hands. But as for me, how many times, as all the world very well knows, have I delivered, either by power or fraud, those that have faithfully served me from him and his, though taken by them. And so I will deliver thee. Christian, his forbearing at present to deliver them is on purpose to try their love, whether they will cleave to him to the end, and as for the ill end thou sayest they come to, that is most glorious in their account, for, for present deliverance, they do not much expect it, for they stay for their glory, and then they shall have it, when their prince comes in his, and the glory of the angels. Apollyon, thou hast already been unfaithful in thy service to him, and how dost thou think to receive wages of him? Christian, wherein, O Apollyon, have I been unfaithful to him? Apollyon, thou didst faint at first setting out, when thou was almost choked 
Egypt in the Gulf of Despond. Thou didst attempt wrong ways to be rid of thy burden, whereas thou shouldst have stayed till thy prince had taken it off. Thou didst sinfully sleep and lose thy choice thing. Thou wast also almost persuaded to go back at the sight of the lions. And when thou talkest of thy journey, and of what thou hast heard and seen, thou art inwardly desirous of vain glory in all that thou sayest or doest. Christian, all this is true, and much more which thou hast left out. But the prince whom I serve and honour is merciful, and ready to forgive. But besides, these infirmities possessed me in thy country, for there I sucked them in, and I have groaned under them, been sorry for them, and have obtained pardon of my prince. Apollyon Then Apollyon broke out into grievous rage, saying, I am an enemy to this prince, I hate his person, his laws and people. I am come out on purpose to withstand thee. Christian, Apollyon, beware what you do, for I am in the king's highway, the way of holiness. Therefore take heed to yourself. Apollyon. Then Apollyon straddled quite over the whole breadth of the way, and said, I am void of fear in this matter. Prepare thyself to die, for I swear by my infernal den that thou shalt go no further. Here will I spill thy soul. And with that he threw a flaming dart at his breast, but Christian had a shield in his hand with which he caught it, and so prevented the danger of that. Then did Christian draw, for he saw it was time to bestir him, and Apollyon as fast made at him, throwing darts as thick as hail, by the which, notwithstanding all that Christian could do to avoid it, Apollyon wounded him in his head, his hand, and foot. This made Christian give a little back. Apollyon, therefore, followed his work amain, and Christian again took courage, and resisted as manfully as he could. This sore combat lasted for above half a day, even till Christian was almost quite spent, for you must know that Christian, by reason of his wounds, must needs grow weaker and weaker. Then Apollyon, espying his opportunity, began to gather up close to Christian, and wrestling with him, gave him a dreadful fall, and with that Christian's sword flew out of his hand. Then said Apollyon, I am sure of thee now, and with that he had almost pressed him to death, so that Christian began to despair of life. But as God would have it, while Apollyon was fetching of his last blow, thereby to make a full end of this good man, Christian nimbly stretched out his hand for his sword, and caught it, saying, Rejoice not against me, O mine enemy, when I fall I shall arise, and with that gave him a deadly thrust, which made him give back, as one that had received his mortal wound. Christian, perceiving that, made at him again, saying, Nay, in all these things we are more than conquerors through him that loved us. And with that Apollyon spread forth his dragon's wings and sped him away, that Christian for a season saw him no more. In this combat no man can imagine unless he had seen and heard as I did, what yelling and hideous roaring 
Apollyon made all the time of the fight. He spake like a dragon, and on the other side, what sighs and groans burst from Christian's heart. I never saw him, all the while, give so much as one pleasant look, till he perceived he had wounded Apollyon with his two-edged sword. Then, indeed, he did smile and look upward, but twas the dreadfullest sight that ever I saw. So when the battle was over, Christian said, I will here give thanks to him that hath delivered me out of the mouth of the lion, to him that did help me against Apollyon. And so he did, saying, Great Beelzebub, the captain of this fiend, designed my ruin therefore to this end. He sent him, harnessed out, and he with rage that hellish was, did fiercely me engage. But blessed Michael helped me, and I by dint of sword did quickly make him fly. Therefore to him let me give lasting praise, and thank and bless his holy name always. Then there came to him a hand with some of the leaves of the tree of life, the which Christian took and applied to the wounds that he had received in battle, and was healed immediately. He also sat down in that place to eat bread, and to drink of the bottle that was given him a little before. So being refreshed, he addressed himself to his journey, with his sword drawn in his hand, for he said, I know not, but some other enemy may be at hand. But he met with no other affront from Apollyon, quite through this valley. THE DELECTABLE MOUNTAINS they went then till they came to the delectable mountains, which mountains belong to the lord of that hill of which we have spoken before. So they went up to the mountains, to behold the gardens and orchards, the vineyards and fountains of water, where also they drank and washed themselves, and did freely eat of the vineyards. Now there were on the tops of these mountains shepherds feeding their flocks, and they stood by the highway side. The pilgrims therefore went to them, and leaning upon their staves, as is common with weary pilgrims, when they stand to talk with any by the way, they ask, Whose delectable mountains are these, and whose be the sheep that feed upon them? Shepherds. These mountains are Emmanuel's land, and they are within sight of his city, and the sheep also are his, and he laid down his life for them. Christian, is this the way to the celestial city? Shepherds, you are just in your way. Christian, how far is it thither? Shepherds, too far for any but those that shall get thither indeed. Christian, is the way safe or dangerous? Shepherds, safe for those for whom it is to be safe, but transgressors shall fall therein. Christian, is there in this place any relief for pilgrims that are weary and faint in the way? Shepherds, the Lord of these mountains hath given us a charge, not to be forgetful to entertain strangers. Therefore the good of the place is before you. I saw also in my dream that when the shepherds perceived that they were wayfaring men, they also put questions to them, 
to which they made answer as in other places, as, whence came you, and have got you into the way, and by what means have you so persevered therein? For but few of them that begin to come hither do show their face on these mountains. But when the shepherds heard their answers, being pleased therewith, they looked very lovingly upon them, and said, Welcome to the delectable mountains. The shepherds, I say, whose names were knowledge, experience, watchful and sincere, took them by the hand, and had them to their tents, and made them partake of that which was ready at present. They said, moreover, we would that ye should stay here a while, to be acquainted with us, and yet more to solace yourselves with the good of these delectable mountains. They then told them that they were content to stay, and so they went to their rest that night, because it was very late. Then I saw in my dream that in the morning the shepherds called up Christian and Hopeful to walk with them upon the mountains. So they went forth with them, and walked a while, having a pleasant prospect on every side. Then said the shepherds one to another, Shall we show these pilgrims some wonders? So when they had concluded to do it, they had them first to the top of a hill called Error which was very steep on the furthest side, and bid them look down to the bottom. So Christian and Hopeful looked down, and saw at the bottom several men dashed all to pieces by a fall that they had from the top. Then said Christian, What meaneth this? The shepherds answered, Have you not heard of them that were made to err? by hearkening to Hymenaeus and Philetus, as concerning the faith of the resurrection of the body? They answered, Yes. Then said the shepherds, Those that you see lie dashed in pieces at the bottom of this mountain are they, and they have continued to this day unburied as you see, for an example to others to take heed how they clamber too high, or how they come too near the brink of this mountain. Then I saw that they had them to the top of another mountain, and the name of that is Caution, and bid them look afar off, which when they did, they perceived, as they thought, several men walking up and down among the tombs that were there, and they perceived that the men were blind, because they stumbled sometimes upon the tombs, and because they could not get out from among them. Then said Christian, What means this? The shepherds then answered, Did you not see, a little below these mountains, a stile that led into a meadow, on the left hand of this way? They answered, Yes. Then said the shepherds, From that stile, there goes a path that leads directly to Doubting Castle, which is kept by giant despair, and these men, pointing to them among the tombs, came once on pilgrimages as you do now, even till they came to that same style, and because the right way was rough in that place, and they chose to go out of it into that meadow, and there were taken by giant despair, and cast into Doubting Castle, where, after they had been a while kept in the dungeon, he at last did put out their eyes, and led them among those tombs, where he has left them to wander to this very day, that the saying of the wise men might be fulfilled. He that wandereth out of the way of understanding shall remain in the congregation of the dead. Then Christian and Hopeful looked upon one another, with tears gushing out, but yet said nothing to the shepherds. Then I saw in my dream 
that the shepherds had them to another place, in a bottom, where was a door in the side of the hill, and they opened the door, and bid them look in. They looked in, therefore, and saw that within it was very dark and smoky. They also thought that they heard there a rumbling noise as of fire, and a cry as of some tormented, and that they smelt the scent of brimstone. Then said Christian, What means this? The shepherds told them, This is a byway to hell, a way that hypocrites go in at, namely, such as sell their birthright with Esau, such as sell their master as Judas, such as blaspheme the gospel with Alexander, and that lie and dissemble with Ananias and Sapphira his wife. Then said Hopeful to the shepherds, I perceive that these had on them, even every one, a show of pilgrimage as we have now, had they not? Shepherds, yes, and held it a long time too. Hopeful, how far might they go on in pilgrimage in their day, since they, notwithstanding, were thus miserably cast away? Shepherds, some further, and some not so far as these mountains. Then said the pilgrims one to another, We had need to cry to the strong for strength. Shepherds, ay, and you will have need to use it when you have it too. By this time the pilgrims had a desire to go forwards, and the shepherds a desire they should. So they walked together towards the end of the mountains. Then said the shepherds one to another, Let us here show to the pilgrims the gates of the celestial city, if they had the skill to look through our perspective glass. The pilgrims then lovingly accepted the motion. So they had them to the top of a high hill called Clear, and gave them their glass to look. Then they essayed to look but the remembrance of that last thing that the shepherds had showed them made their hands shake, by means of which impediment they could not look steadily through the glass. Yet they thought they saw something like the gate, and also some of the glory of the place. End of section four. Section 5 of Library of the World's Best Literature, Ancient and Modern, Volume 7. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. A recording by Tony Addison Library of the World's Best Literature Ancient and Modern Volume 7 By Various Authors Section 5 Selected Excerpts from The Pilgrim's Progress By John Bunyan Part Two. Christiana and her companions enter the celestial city. Now, while they lay here and waited for the good hour, there was a noise in the town that there was a post come from the celestial city with matter of great importance to one Christiana the wife of Christian the pilgrim. So inquiry was made for her, and the house was found out where she was. So the post presented her with a letter, the contents whereof was, Hail, good woman, I bring thee tidings, that the master calleth for thee, and expecteth that thou shouldst stand in his presence 
in clothes of immortality, within this ten days. When he had read this letter to her, he gave her therewith a sure token that he was a true messenger, and was come to bid her make haste to be gone. The token was an arrow with a point sharpened with love, let easily into her heart which by degrees wrought so effectually with her that at the time appointed she must be gone. When Christiana saw that her time was come, and that she was the first of this company that was to go over, she called for Mr. Greatheart, her guide, and told him how matters were. So he told her he was heartily glad of the news, and could have been glad had the post come for him. Then she bid that he should give advice how all things should be prepared for her journey. So he told her, saying, Thus and thus it must be, and we that survive will accompany you to the riverside. Then she called for her children and gave them her blessing, and told them that she yet read with comfort the mark that was set in their foreheads, and was glad to see them with her there, and that they had kept their garments so white. Lastly she bequeathed to the poor that little she had, and commanded her sons and daughters to be ready against the messenger should come for them. When she had spoken these words to her guide and to her children, she called for Mr. Valiant for truth, and said unto him, Sir, you have in all places showed yourself true-hearted, be faithful unto death, and my king will give you a crown of life. I would also entreat you to have an eye to my children, and if at any time you see them faint, speak comfortably to them. For my daughters, my sons, wives, they have been faithful, and a fulfilling of the promise upon them will be their end. But she gave Mr. Standfast a ring. Then she called for old Mr. Honest, and said of him, Behold, an Israelite indeed, in whom is no guile. Then said he, I wish you a fair day, when you set out for Mount Zion and shall be glad to see that you go over the river dry shod. But she answered, Come wet, come dry, I long to be gone, for however the weather is in my journey, I shall have time enough when I come there to sit down and rest me and dry me. Then came in that good man, Mr. Ready to halt, to see her. So she said to him, Thy travel hither, has been with difficulty, but that will make thy rest the sweeter. But watch and be ready, for at an hour when you think not, the messenger may come. After him came in Mr. Despondency, and his daughter much afraid, to whom she said, You ought with thankfulness for ever to remember your deliverance from the hands of giant despair, and out of doubting castle. The effect of that mercy is, that you are brought with safety hither. Be ye watchful, and cast away fear. Be sober, and hope to the end. Then she said to Mr. Feeble Mind, Thou wast delivered from the mouth of giant Slaygood, that thou mightest live in the light of the living for ever, and see thy king with comfort. Only I advise thee to repent thee of thine aptness to fear and doubt of his goodness before he sends for thee, lest thou shouldest, when he comes, be forced to stand before him for that fault with blushing. Now the day drew on, that Christiana must be gone. So the road was full of people to see her take her journey. But behold, 
all the banks beyond the river were full of horses and chariots, which were come down from above to accompany her to the city gate. So she came forth and entered the river with a beckon of farewell to those who followed her to the riverside. The last words she was heard to say here was, I come, Lord, to be with thee and bless thee. So her children and friends returned to their place, for that those that waited for Christiana had carried her out of their sight. So she went and called and entered in at the gate with all the ceremonies of joy that her husband Christian had done before her. At her departure her children wept, but Mr. Greatheart and Mr. Valiant played upon the well-tuned cymbal and harp for joy. So all departed to their respective places. In process of time there came a post to the town again, and his business was with Mr. Ready to halt. So he inquired him out and said to him, I am come to thee in the name of him whom thou hast loved and followed, though upon crutches, and my message is to tell thee that he expects thee at his table to sup with him in his kingdom the next day after Easter. Wherefore, prepare thyself for this journey. Then he also gave him a token that he was a true messenger, saying, I have broken thy golden bowl, and loosed thy silver cord. After this, Mr. Ready to Halt called for his fellow pilgrims, and told them, saying, I am sent for, and God shall surely visit you also. So he desired Mr. Valiant to make his will, and because he had nothing to bequeath to them that should survive him but his crutches and his good wishes, therefore thus he said, These crutches I bequeath to my son that shall tread in my steps, with a hundred warm wishes that he may prove better than I have done. Then he thanked Mr. Greatheart, for his conduct and kindness, and so addressed himself to his journey. When he came at the brink of the river, he said, Now I shall have no more need of these crutches, since yonder are chariots and horses for me to ride on. The last words he was heard to say were, Welcome, life. So he went his way. After this, Mr. Feeblemind had tidings brought him that the post sounded his horn at his chamber door. Then he came in and told him, saying, I am come to tell thee that thy master has needed thee, and that in very little time thou must behold his face in brightness, and take this as a token of the truth of my message. Those that look out at the windows shall be darkened. Then Mr. Feeblemind called for his friends, and told them what errand had been brought unto him, and what token he had received of the truth of the message. Then he said, Since I have nothing to bequeath to any, to what purpose should I make a will? As for my feeble mind, that I will leave behind me, for that I have no need of that in the place whither I go nor is it worth bestowing upon the poorest pilgrim. Wherefore, when I am gone, I desire that you, Mr. Valiant, would bury it in a dunghill. This done, and the day being come in which he was to depart, he entered the river as the rest. His last words were, Hold out faith and patience. So he went over to the other side. When days had many of them passed away, Mr. Despondency was sent for, for a post was come and brought this message to him. Trembling man, 
these are to summon thee to be ready with thy king by the next lord's day to shout for joy for thy deliverance from all thy doubtings and said the messenger that my message is true take this for a proof so he gave him the grasshopper to be a burden unto him now mr despondency's daughter whose name was much afraid said when she heard what was done that she should go with her father then mr despondency said to his friends myself and my daughter you know what we have been and how troublesomely we have behaved ourselves in every company my will and my daughter's is that our desponds and slavish fears be by no man ever received from the day of our departure for ever for i know that after my death they will offer themselves to others for to be plain with you they are ghosts the which we entertained when we first began to be pilgrims and could never shake them off after and they will walk about and seek entertainment of the pilgrims but for our sakes shut ye the doors upon them when the time was come for them to depart they went to the brink of the river the last words of mr despondency were farewell night welcome day his daughter went through the river singing but none could understand what she said then it came to pass a while after that there was a post in the town that inquired for mr honest when the day that he was to be gone was come he addressed himself to go over the river now the river at that time overflowed the banks in some places but mr honest in his lifetime had spoken to one good conscience to meet him there the which he also did and lent him his hand and so helped him over the last words of mr honest were grace reigns so he left the world after this it was noised abroad that mr valiant for truth was taken with a summons by the same post as the other and had this for a token that the summons was true that his pitcher was broken at the fountain when he understood it he called for his friends and told them of it then said he i am going to my father's and though with great difficulty i am got hither yet now i do not repent me of all the trouble i have been at to arrive where i am my sword i give to him that shall succeed me in my pilgrimage and my courage and skill to him that can get it my marks and scars i carry with me to be a witness for me that I have fought his battles, who now will be my rewarder. When the day that he must go hence was come, many accompanied him to the riverside, into which, as he went, he said, Death, where is thy sting? And as he went down deeper, he said, Grave, where is thy victory? So he passed over, and all the trumpets sounded for him, on the other side then there came forth a summons for mr standfast this mr standfast was he that the rest of the pilgrims found upon his knees in the enchanted ground for the post brought it him open in his hands the contents whereof were that he must prepare for a change of life for his master was not willing that he should be so far from him any longer. At this Mr. Standfast was put into a muse. Nay, said the messenger, you need not doubt of the truth of my message, for here is a token of the truth thereof. Thy wheel is broken at the cistern. Then he called to him Mr. Greatheart, who was their guide, and said unto him, Sir, although it was not my hap to be much in your good company in the days of my pilgrimage, yet since the time I knew you 
you have been profitable to me. When I came from home, I left behind me a wife and five small children. Let me entreat you at your return, for I know that you will go and return to your master's house, in hopes that you may yet be a conductor to more of the holy pilgrims, that you send to my family, and let them be acquainted with all that hath and shall happen unto me. Tell them, moreover, of my happy arrival to this place, and of the present late blessed condition that I am in. Tell them also of Christian, and Christiana his wife, and how she and her children came after her husband. Tell them also of what a happy end she made, and whither she is gone. I have little or nothing to send to my family, except it be prayers and tears for them, of which it will suffice if thou acquaint them, if peradventure they may prevail. When Mr. Standfast had thus set things in order, and the time being come for him to haste him away, he also went down to the river. Now there was a great calm at that time in the river, wherefore Mr. Standfast, when he was about halfway in, he stood a while, and talked to his companions that had waited upon him thither, and he said, This river has been a terror to many, yea, the thoughts of it also have often frighted me, but now methinks I stand easy, my foot is fixed upon that upon which the feet of the priests that bear the Ark of the Covenant stood, while Israel went over this Jordan. The waters indeed are to the palate bitter, and to the stomach cold, yet the thought of what I am going to, and of the conduct that waits for me on the other side, doth lie as a glowing coal to my heart. I see myself now at the end of my journey. My toilsome days are ended. I am going now to see that head that was crowned with thorns, and that face that was spit upon for me. I have formerly lived by hearsay and faith, but now I go where I shall live by sight, and shall be with him, in whose company I delight myself. I have loved to hear my Lord spoken of, and wherever I have seen the print of his shoe in the earth, there I have coveted to set my foot to. His name has been to me as a sippet box, yea, sweeter than all perfumes. His voice to me has been most sweet, and his countenance I have more desired than they that have most desired the light of the sun. His word I did use to gather for my food, and for antidotes against my faintings. He has held me, and I have kept me from mine iniquities, yea, my steps hath he strengthened in his way. Now while he was thus in discourse, his countenance changed, his strong man bowed under him, and after he had said, Take me, for I come unto thee, he ceased to be seen of them. But glorious it was to see how the open region was filled with horses and chariots with trumpeters and pipers, with singers and players on stringed instruments, to welcome the pilgrims as they went up, and followed one another in at the beautiful gate of the city. End of section 5section six of library of the world's best literature ancient and modern volume seven this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox dot org recording by john burlinson library of the world's best literature ancient and modern Volume 7, by Various Authors. Section 6. Selected Poems by Gottfried August Berger, 1747-1794. The Ballad of Lenore 
upon which Berger's fame chiefly rests, was published in 1773. It constituted one of the articles in that Declaration of Independence which the young poets of the time were formulating, and it was more than a mere coincidence that in the same year Herder wrote his essay on Ossian and the Songs of Ancient Peoples, and Goethe unfurled the banner of a new time in Goethe's von Berlichingen, the artificial and sentimental trivialities of the pigtail age were superseded almost at a stroke, and the petty formalism under which the literature of Germany was languishing fell about the powdered wigs of its professional representatives. The new impulse came from England. As in France, Rousseau, preaching the gospel of a return to nature, found his texts in English writers. So, in Germany, the poets who inaugurated the classic age derived their chief inspiration from the wholesome heart of England. It was Shakespeare that inspired Goethe's Goethe's, Ossian, and the old English and Scotch folk songs were Herder's theme, and Percy's relics stimulated and saved the genius of Berger. This was the movement which, for lack of a better term, has been called the naturalistic. Literature once more took possession of the whole range of human life and experience, descending from her artificial throne to live with peasant and people. These ardent innovators spurned all ancient rules and conventions, and in the first ecstasy of their new-found freedom and unchastened strength, it is no wonder that they went too far. Goethe and Schiller learned betimes the salutary lesson of artistic restraint. Berger never learned it. Berger was wholly a child of his time. At the age of twenty-six, he wrote Lenore, and his genius never again attained that height. Much may be accomplished in the first outburst of youthful energy, but without the self-control which experience should teach, and without the moral character which is the condition of great achievement, genius rots ere it is ripe, and this was the case with Berger. We are reminded of Burns. Goethe, in his seventy-eighth year, said to Eckermann, What songs Berger and Voss have written? Who would say that they are less valuable or less redolent of their native soil than the exquisite songs of Burns? Like Burns, Berger was of humble origin. Like Burns, he gave passion and impulse the reins, and drove to his own destruction. Like Burns, he left behind him a body of truly national and popular poetry, which is still alive in the mouths of the people. Berger was born in the last hour of the year 1747 at Molmerswende. His father was a country clergyman, and he himself was sent to Halle at the age of seventeen to study theology. His wild life there led to his removal to Göttingen, where he took up the study of law. He became a member and afterwards the leader of the famous Göttinger Dichterbund, and was carried away, and for a time, rescued from his evil courses by his enthusiasm for Shakespeare and Percy's relics, he contributed to the newly established Missenarmenach, and from 1779 until his death in 1794, he was its editor. In 1787, the university conferred an honorary degree upon him and he was soon afterward made a professor without salary, 
lecturing on Kantian philosophy and aesthetics. Three times he was married. His days were full of financial struggles and self-wrought misery. There is little in his private life that is creditable to record. A dissolute youth was followed by a misguided manhood, and he died in his forty-seventh year. It fell to the lot of the young Goethe to write for the Frankfurter Gelehrte Anzeigen in November 1772 a notice of some of Berger's early poems. The Minnelide of Mr. Berger, he says, is worthy of a better age, and if he has more such happy moments, these efforts of his will be among the most potent influences to render our sentimental poetasters with their gold paper amours and graces and their elysium of benevolence and philanthropy utterly forgotten. With such clear vision could Goethe see at the age of twenty-three. But he soon saw also the danger that lay in unbridled freedom. For the best that was in Berger, Goethe retained his admiration to the last. But before he was thirty, he felt that their ways had parted. Among the maxims and reflections, we find this note. It is sad to see how an extraordinary man may struggle with his time, with his circumstances, often even with himself, and never prosper. Sad example, Berger. Doubtless German literature owes less to Berger than English owes to Verne's, but it owes much. Berger revived the ballad form in which so much of the finest German poetry has since been cast. With his lyric gifts and his dramatic power, he infused a life into these splendid poems that has made them a part of the folklore of his native land. Leonardo and Blandine, his own favorite, Der Pfarrer's Tochter von Taubenheim, the pastor's daughter of Taubenheim, Das Lied von Braven Mann, The Song of the Brave Man, Die Weiber von Weinsberg, The Women of Weinsberg, Der Kaiser und der Abt, The Emperor and the Abbot, Der Wilde Jäger, The Wild Huntsman, all belong, like Lenore, to the literary inheritance of the German people. Berger attempted a translation of the Iliad in iambic blank verse and a prose translation of Macbeth. To him belongs also the credit of having restored to German literature the long-disused sonnet. His sonnets are among the best in the language and elicited warm praise from Schiller as models of their kind. Schiller had written a severe criticism of Berger's poems which had inflamed party strife and embittered the last years of Berger himself. But even Schiller admits that Berger is as much superior to all his rivals as he is inferior to the ideal he should have striven to attain. The debt which Berger owed to English letters was amply repaid. In Lenore he showed Percy's reliques the compliment of quoting from the ballad of Sweet William, which had supplied him with his theme. The lines, Is there any room at your head, Willie, or any room at your feet? The first literary work of Walter Scott was the translation which he made in 1775 of Lenore, under the title of William and Helen. This was quickly followed by a translation of The Wild Huntsman. Scott's romantic mind received in Berger's ballads and in Goethe's Goetz, which he translated four years later, just the nourishment it craved. It is a curious coincidence that another great romantic writer, Alexandre Dumas, 
should also have begun his literary career with a translation of Lenore. Berger was not, however, a man of one poem. He filled two goodly volumes, but the oft-quoted words of his friend Schlegel contain the essential truth. Lenore will always be Berger's jewel, the precious ring with which, like the doge of Venice espousing the sea, he married himself to the folk song forever. William and Helen, Walter Scott's translation of Lenore. From heavy dreams, fair Helen rose and eyed the dawning red. Alas, my love, thou tarriest long. Oh, art thou false or dead? With gallant Frederick's princely power he sought the bold crusade, but not a word from Judah's wars told Helen how he sped. With Canaan and with Saracen at length the truce was made and every night returned to dry the tears his love had shed. Our gallant host was homeward bound with many a song of joy. Green waved the laurel in each plume, the badge of victory. And old and young, and sire and son, to meet them crowd the way, with shouts and mirth and melody, the debt of love to pay. Full many a maid her true love met, and sobbed in his embrace, and fluttering joy and tears and smiles arrayed full many a face. Nor joy nor smile for Helen sad, she sought the host in vain, for none could tell her William's fate, if faithless or if slain. The martial band is past and gone. She rends her raven hair, and in distraction's bitter mood she weeps with wild despair. Oh, rise, my child, her mother said, nor sorrow thus in vain. A perjured lover's fleeting heart no tears recall again. Oh, mother, what is gone is gone, what's lost forever lorn. Death Death alone can comfort me. Oh, had I ne'er been born. Oh, break my heart. Oh, break at once. Drink my life-blood, despair. No joy remains on earth for me. For me in heaven no share. Oh, enter not in judgment, Lord, the pious mother prays. Impute not guilt to thy frail child. She knows not what she says. O oh, say thy paternoster, child. O oh, turn to God and grace. His will that turned thy bliss to bale can change thy bale to bliss. O oh, mother, mother, what is bliss? O oh, mother, what is bale? My William's love was heaven on earth. Without it, earth is hell. Why should I pray to ruthless heaven, since my loved William slain? I only prayed for William's sake, and all my prayers were vain. Oh, take the sacrament, my child, and check these tears that flow. By resignation's humble prayer, Oh, hallowed be thy woe. No sacrament can quench this fire or slake this scorching pain. No sacrament can bid the dead arise and live again. Oh, break my heart. Oh, break at once. Be thou my God, despair. Heaven's heaviest blow has fallen on me and vain each fruitless prayer. Oh, enter not in judgment, Lord, with thy frail child of clay. She knows not what her tongue has spoke. Impute it not, I pray. Forbear, my child, this desperate woe, and turn to God and grace. 
Well can devotion's heavenly glow convert thy bale to bliss. O oh, mother, mother, what is bliss? O oh, mother, what is bale? Without my William, what were heaven? Or with him, what were hell? Wild she arraigns the eternal doom, upbraids each sacred power, till, spent, she sought her silent room, all in the lonely tower. She beat her breast, she wrung her hands, till sun and day were o'er, and through the glimmering lattice shone the twinkling of the star. Then crash! The heavy drawbridge fell that o'er the moat was hung, and clatter, clatter on its boards the hoof of courser rung. The clank of echoing steel was heard as off the rider bounded, and slowly on the winding stair a heavy footstep sounded. And a hark, and a hark, a knock, tap, tap, a rustling stifled noise. Door latch and tinkling staples ring, at length a whispering voice. Awake, awake, arise, my love. How, Helen, dost thou fare? Wakes thou or sleeps? Laughs thou or weeps? Hast thought on me, my fair? My love, my love, so late at night I wake, I wept for thee. Much have I borne since dawn of morn. Where, William, couldst thou be? We saddle late from Hungary. I rode since darkness fell. And to its bourne we both return before the matin bell. Oh, rest this night within my arms, and warm thee in their fold. Chill howls through hawthorn bush the wind. My love, tis deadly cold. Let the wind howl through hawthorn bush. This night we must away. The steed is white, the spur is bright, I cannot stay till day. Busk, busk and boon, thou mount'st behind upon my black barb steed, or stalked and style a hundred mile, we haste to bridal bed. Tonight, tonight a hundred miles, O oh, dearest William, stay. The bell strikes twelve, dark, dismal hour. Oh, wait, my love, till day. Look here, look here, the moon shines clear. Full fast I ween we ride. Mount and away, for ere the day we reach our bridal bed. The black barb snorts, the bridal rings. Haste, busk, and boon, and seek thee. The feast is made, the chamber spread, The bridal guests await thee. Strong love prevail, she busks, she boons, She mounts the barb behind, And round her darling William's waist Her lily arms she twined. And hurry, hurry, off they rode, and fast as fast might be, spurned from the courser's thundering heels, the flashing pebbles flee. And on the right and on the left, ere they could snatch a view, fast, fast each mountain, mead, and plain, and cot and castle flew. Sit fast, dost fear, the moon shines clear, fleet goes my barb, keep hold. Fearst thou? Oh, no, she faintly said, but why so stern and cold? What yonder rings, what yonder sings? Why shrieks the owlet grey? 
Tis death bell's clang, tis funeral song, the body to the clay. With song and clang at morrow's dawn, ye may inter the dead. Tonight I ride with my young bride to deck our bridal bed. Come with thy choir, thou coffin guest, to swell our nuptial song. Come, priest, to bless our marriage feast. Come all, come all along. Ceased clang and song, down sunk the bier, the shrouded corpse arose, and hurry, hurry, all the train the thundering steed pursues. And forward, forward on they go, high snorts the straining steed, thick pants the rider's laboring breath as headlong on they speed. O oh, William, why this savage haste? And where thy bridal bed? Tis distant far, low, damp and chill, and narrow, trustless maid. No room for me? Enough for both. Speed, speed, my barb, thy course. O'er thundering bridge, through boiling surge, he drove the furious horse. Tramp, tramp, along the land they rode, splash, splash, along the sea. The scourge is white, the spur is bright, the flashing pebbles flee. Fled past on right and left, how fast each forest, grove, and bower, on right and left fled past how fast each city, town, and tower. Dost fear? Dost fear? The moon shines clear. Dost fear to ride with me? Hurrah! Hurrah! The dead can ride! Oh, William, let them be. See there! See there! What yonder swings and creaks mid whistling rain? Gibbet and steel, the cursed wheel, a murderer in his chain. Hallo, thou felon, follow here. To bridal bed we ride, and thou shalt prance a fetter dance before me and my bride. And hurry, hurry, clash, clash, clash. The wasted form descends, and fleet as wind through hazel bush the wild career attends. Tramp, tramp along the land they rode, splash, splash along the sea. The scourge is red, the spur drops blood, the flashing pebbles flee. How fled what moonshine faintly showed, how fled what darkness hid. How fled the earth beneath their feet, the heaven above their head. Dost fear, dost fear, the moon shines clear, and well the dead can ride. Dost faithful Helen fear for them? Oh, leave in peace the dead. Barb, Barb, methinks I hear the cock. The sand will soon be run. Barb, Barb, I smell the morning air. The race is well nigh done. Tramp, tramp along the land they rode. Splash, splash along the sea. The scourge is red. The spur drops blood. The flashing pebbles flee. Hurrah, hurrah. Well ride the dead, the bride, the bride is come, and soon we reach the bridal bed, for Helen, here's my home. Reluctant on its rusty hinge, revolved an iron door, and by the pale moon's setting beam were seen a church and tower. With many a shriek and cry whiz round the birds of midnight scared and rustling like autumnal leaves, unhallowed ghosts were heard. O'er many a tomb and tombstone pale he spurred the fiery horse, till sudden at an open grave he checked the wondrous course. The falling gauntlet quits the rein, down drops the cask of steel, the cuirass leaves his shrinking side, the spur, his gory heel. The eyes desert the naked skull, the mouldering flesh the bone, till Helen's lily arms entwine a ghastly skeleton. The furious barb snorts fire and foam, and with a fearful bound dissolves at once in empty air and leaves her on the ground. 
half seen by fits, by fits half heard, pale spectres flit along. Wheel round the maid in dismal dance and howl the funeral song. E'en when the hearts with anguish cleft revere the doom of heaven, her soul is from her body reft, her spirit be forgiven. The Wives of Weinsberg which way to Weinsberg, neighbor, say? Tis sure a famous city. It must have cradled in its day Full many a maid of noble clay, And matrons wise and witty. And if ever marriage should happen to me, A Weinsberg dame my wife shall be. King Conrad once, historians say, Fell out with this good city. So down he came one luckless day, Horse, foot, Dragoons in stern array, and cannon, more's the pity, around the walls the artillery roared, and bursting bombs their fury poured. But not the little town could scare, then, red with indignation, he bade the herald straight repair up to the gates and thunder there the following proclamation. Rascals, when I your town to take, no living thing shall save its neck. Now, when the herald's trumpets sent these tidings through the city, to every home a death knell went, such murder cries the hot air rent might move the stones to pity. Then bread grew dear, but good advice could not be had for any price. Then, woe is me, oh misery, what shrieks of lamentation! And Kyrie eleison cried, the pastors and the flock replied, Lord, save us from starvation. Oh, woe is me, poor Corridon, my neck, my neck, I'm gone, I'm gone. Yes, oft when counsel, deed, and prayer had all proved unavailing, when hope hung trembling on a hair, how oft has woman's wit been there, a refuge never failing. For women's wit and papal fraud of olden time were famed abroad. A youthful dame, praise be her name, last night had seen her plighted, whether in waking hour or dream, conceived a rare and novel scheme which all the town delighted, which you, if you think otherwise, had leave to laugh at and despise. At midnight hour, when culverine and gun and bomb were sleeping, before the camp with mournful mien the loveliest embassy were seen all kneeling low and weeping so sweetly plaintively they prayed but no reply save this was made the women had free leave to go each with her choicest treasure but let the knaves their husbands know that unto them the king will show the weight of his displeasure with these sad terms the lovely train stole weeping from the camp again. But when the morning gilt the sky, what happened? Give attention. The city gates wide open fly, and all the wives come trudging by, each bearing, need I mention, her own dear husband on her back, as snugly seated in a sack. Full many a sprig of court, the joke, not relishing, protested, and urged the king but Conrad spoke, a monarch's word must not be broke, and here the matter rested. Bravo, he cried, ha, ha, bravo, our lady guessed it would be so. He pardoned all, and gave a ball that night at royal quarters. The fiddles squeaked, the trumpets blew, and up and down the dancers flew, court sprigs with city daughters. The mayor's wife, oh, rarest sight, danced with the shoemaker that night. Ah, where is Weinsberg, sir, I pray? Tis sure a famous city. It must have cradled in its day full many a maid of noble clay, and matrons wise and witty. And if ever marriage should happen to me, a Weinsberg dame my wife shall be. Translated by C. T. Brooks reprinted from representative German poems by the courtesy of Mrs. Charles T. Brooks. 
End of section 6. Recording by John Burlinson. Section 7 of Library of the World's Best Literature, Ancient and Modern, Volume 7. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Bruce Peary. Library of the World's Best Literature, Ancient and Modern, Volume 7, by various authors. Section 7. Biographical Note on Edmund Burke, by E. L. Godkin. Edmund Burke, 1729 to 1797. Edmund Burke, born in Dublin, Ireland in 1729, was the son of a successful attorney who gave him as good an education as the times and the country afforded. He went to school to an excellent Quaker and graduated at Trinity College in 1748. He appears to have then gone to London in 1750 to keep terms, as it was called, at the Middle Temple, with the view of being admitted to the bar, in obedience to his father's desire and ambition. But the desultory habit of mind, the preference for literature and philosophical speculation to connected study, which had marked his career in college, followed him and prevented any serious application to the law. His father's patience was, after a while, exhausted, and he withdrew Burke's allowance and left him to his own resources. This was in 1755, but in 1756 he married and made his first appearance in the literary world by the publication of a book. About these years, from 1750 to 1759, little is known. He published two works— one a treatise on the origin of our ideas of the sublime and beautiful, and the other a vindication of natural society, a satire on Bolingbroke. Stray allusions and anecdotes about other men in the diaries and correspondence of the time show that he frequented the literary coffee-houses, and was gradually making an impression on the authors and wits whom he met there. Besides the two books we have mentioned, he produced some smaller things, such as an essay on the drama and part of an abridgment of the history of England. But although these helped to secure him admission to the literary set, they did not raise him out of the rank of obscure literary adventurers, who from the revolution of 1688, and especially after the union with Scotland, began to swarm to London from all parts of the three kingdoms. The first recognition of him as a serious writer was his employment by Dodsley, the bookseller, at a salary of one hundred dollars a year, to edit the annual register, which Dodsley founded in 1769. Considered as a biographical episode, this may fairly be treated as a businessman's certificate that Burke was industrious and accurate. As his income from his father was withdrawn or reduced in 1755, there remained four years during which his way of supporting himself is unknown. His published works were certainly not potboilers. He was probably to some extent dependent on his wife's father, Dr. Nugent, an Irish physician who, when Burke made his acquaintance, lived in Bath, but after his daughter's marriage settled in London, and seems to have frequented and have been acceptable in the same coffee-houses as Burke, and for the same reasons. But Burke was not a man to remain long dependent on anyone. These nine years were evidently not spent fruitlessly. They had made him known, and brought him to the threshold of public life. In 1759, political discussion, as we understand it, that is, those explorations of the foundations of political society and analyses of social relations, which now form our daily intellectual food, was hardly known. The interest in religion as the chief human concern was rapidly declining. The interest in human society as an organism to be studied, and if need be taken to pieces and put together again, was only just beginning. Montesquieu's great work, The Spirit of the Laws, which demanded for expediency and convenience in legislation, the place which modern Europe had long assigned to authority, had only appeared in 1748. 
swift's satires had made serious breaches in the wall of convention by which the state in spite of the convulsions of the seventeenth century was still surrounded but the writer whose speculations excited most attention in england was bolingbroke the charm of his style and the variety of his interests made him the chief intellectual topic of the london world in burke's early youth to write like bolingbroke was a legitimate ambition for a young man it is not surprising that burke felt it and that his earliest political effort was a satire on bolingbroke it attracted the attention of a politician gerard hamilton and he quickly picked up burke as his secretary treated him badly and was abandoned by him in disgust at the end of six years the peculiar condition of the english governmental machine made possible for men of burke's kind at this period what would not be possible now the population had vanished from a good many old boroughs although their representation in parliament remained and the selection of the members fell to the lords of the soil about one hundred and fifty members of the house of commons were in this way chosen by great landed proprietors and it is to be said to their credit that they used their power freely to introduce unknown young men of talent into public life moreover in many cases if not in most small boroughs however well peopled were expected to elect the proprietor's nominee burke after leaving hamilton's service was for a short time private secretary to lord rockingham when the latter succeeded grenville in the ministry in seventeen sixty six but when he went out burke obtained a seat in parliament in seventeen sixty five in the manner we have described for the borough of wendover from lord verney who owned it he made his first successful speech the same year and was complimented by pitt he was already recognized as a man of enormous information as any one who edited the annual register had to be a man of such powers and tastes in that day naturally became a pamphleteer outside of parliament there was no other mode of discussing public affairs the periodical press for purposes of discussion did not exist during and after the great rebellion the pamphlet had made its appearance as the chief instrument of controversy defoe used it freely after the restoration swift made a great hit with it and probably achieved the first sensational sale with his pamphlet on the conduct of the allies bolingbroke's patriot king was a work of the same class as a rule the pamphlet exposed or refuted somebody even if it also freely expounded it was inevitable that burke should early begin to wield this most powerful of existing weapons his antagonist was ready for him in the person of george grenville the minister who had made way for burke's friend and patron lord rockingham grenville showed as easily as any party newspaper in our own day that rockingham and his friends had ruined the country by mismanagement of the war and of the finances burke refuted him with a mastery of facts and figures and a familiarity with the operations of trade and commerce and a power of exposition and illustration and a comprehension of the fundamental conditions of national economy which at once made him famous and a necessary man for the whigs in the great struggle with the crown on which they were entering the nature of this struggle cannot be better described in brief space than by saying that the king from his accession to the throne down to the close of the american war was engaged in a persistent effort to govern through ministers chosen and dismissed as the german ministers are now by himself while the subservience of parliament was secured by the profuse use of pensions and places to this attempt and all the abuses which inevitably grew out of it the whigs with burke as their intellectual head offered a determined resistance and the conflict was one extraordinarily well calculated to bring his peculiar powers into play the leading events in this long struggle were the attempt of the house of commons to disqualify wilkes for a seat in the house to punish reporting their debates as a breach of privilege and the prosecution of the war against the american colonies 
it may be said to have begun at the accession of the king and to have lasted until the resignation of lord north after the surrender of cornwallis or from seventeen seventy to seventeen eighty three burke's contributions to it were his pamphlet thoughts on the cause of the present discontents and several speeches in parliament the first like the pamphlet on the general situation and others on minor incidents in the struggle this pamphlet has not only survived the controversy but has become one of the most famous papers in the political literature of the anglo-saxon race it is a century since every conspicuous figure in the drama passed away it is seventy years since every trace of the controversy disappeared from english political life most if not all of the principles for which burke contended have become commonplaces of english constitutional practice the discontents of that day have vanished as completely as those of sixteen thirty but burke's pamphlet still holds a high place in every course of english literature and is still read and pondered by every student of constitutional history and by every speculator on government and political morals in seventeen seventy four parliament was dissolved for the second time since burke entered it and there a misfortune overtook him which illustrated in a striking way the practical working of the british constitution at that period lord verney to whom he had owed his seat for the borough of wendover at two elections had fallen into pecuniary embarrassment and could no longer return him because compelled to sell his four boroughs this left burke high and dry and he was beginning to tremble for his political future when he was returned for the great commercial city of bristol by a popular constituency the six years during which he sat for bristol were the most splendid portion of his career other portions perhaps contributed as much if not more to his literary or oratorical reputation but this brought out in very bold relief the great traits of character which will always endear his memory to the lovers of national liberty and place him high among the framers of great political ideals in the first place he propounded boldly to the bristol electors the theory that he was to be their representative but not their delegate that his parliamentary action must be governed by his own reason and not by their wishes in the next he resolutely sacrificed his seat by opposing his constituents in supporting the removal of the restrictions on irish trade of which english merchants reaped the benefit he would not be a party to what he considered the oppression of his native country no matter what might be the effect on his political prospects and in seventeen eighty he was not re-elected but the greatest achievement of this period of his history was his share in the controversy over the american war which was really not more a conflict with the colonies over taxation than a resolute and obstinate carrying out of the king's principles of government the colonies were for the time being simply resisting pretensions to which the kingdom at home submitted burke's speeches on american taxation seventeen seventy four on conciliation with america seventeen seventy five and his letter to the sheriffs of bristol seventeen seventy seven on the same subject taken as a sequel to the thoughts on the present discontents form a body of literature which it is not too much to pronounce not only a history of the dispute with the colonies but a veritable political manual he does not confine himself to a minute description of the arguments used in supporting the attempt to coerce america he furnishes as he goes along principles of legislation applicable almost to any condition of society illustrations which light up as by a single flash problems of apparently inscrutable darkness explanations of great political failures and receipts innumerable for political happiness and success a single sentence often disposes of half a dozen fallacies firmly embedded in governmental tradition his own description of the rhetorical art of charles townsend was eminently applicable to himself he knew better by far than any man i ever was acquainted with how to bring together within a short time 
all that was necessary to establish, to illustrate, and to decorate that side of the question which he supported. This observation suggests the great advantage he derives as a political instructor from the facts that all his political speeches and writings are polemical. The difficulty of keeping exposition from being dry is familiar to everybody who has ever sought to communicate knowledge on any subject. But Burke, in every one of his political theses, had an antagonist who was literally, as he says himself, a helper who did the work of an opposing counsel at the bar, in bringing out into prominence all the weak points of Burke's case and all the strong ones of his own, who set in array all the fallacies to be exposed, all the idols to be overthrown, all the doubts to be cleared up. Moreover, he was not, like the man who usually figures in controversial dialogues, a sham opponent but a creature of flesh and blood, like Grenville, or the sheriffs of Bristol, or the king's friends, or the Irish Protestant party, who met Burke with an ardor not inferior to his own. We consequently have, in all his papers and speeches, the very best of which he was capable in thought and expression, for he had not only to watch the city, but to meet the enemy in the gate." After the close of the American War, the remainder of Burke's career was filled with two great subjects to which he devoted himself with an ardor which occasionally degenerated into fanaticism. One was the government of India by the East India Company, and the other was the French Revolution. Although the East India Company had been long in existence and had towards the middle of the 18th century been rapidly extending its power and influence, Comparatively little had been known by the English public of the nature of its operations. Attention had been drawn away from it by the events in America and the long contest with the king in England. By the close of the American War, however, the nabobs, as they were called, or returned English adventurers, began to make a deep impression on English society by the apparent size of their fortunes and the lavishness of their expenditure. Burke calculated that in his time they had brought home about two hundred million dollars, with which they bought estates and seats in Parliament, and became a very conspicuous element in English public and private life. At the same time, information as to the mode in which their money was made and their government carried on was scanty and hard to acquire. The press had no foreign correspondence. India was six months away, and all the Europeans in it were either servants of the company or remained in it on the company's sufferance. The Whigs finally determined to attempt a grand inquisition into its affairs, and a bill was brought in by Fox, withdrawing the government of India from the company and vesting it in a commission named in the bill. This was preceded by eleven reports from a committee of inquiry. But the bill failed utterly, and brought down the Whig ministry, which did not get into office again in Burke's time. This was followed in 1785, on Burke's instigation, by the impeachment of the most conspicuous of the company's officers, Warren Hastings. Burke was appointed one of the managers on behalf of the Commons. No episode in his career is so familiar to the public as his conduct of this trial, owing to Warren Hastings having been the subject of one of the most popular of Macaulay's essays. None brought out more clearly Burke's great dialectical powers, or so well displayed his mastery of details and his power of orderly exposition. The trial lasted eight years, and was adjourned over from one parliamentary session to another. These delays were fatal to its success. The public interest in it died out long before the close, as usual in protracted legal prosecutions. The feeling spread that the defendant could not be very guilty when it took so long to prove his crime. Although Burke toiled over the case with extraordinary industry and persistence and an enthusiasm which never flagged, Hastings was finally acquitted. But the labors of the prosecution were not wholly vain it awoke in England an attention to the government of India which never died out, 
and led to a considerable curtailing of the power of the East India Company, and necessarily of its severity in dealing with Indian states. The impeachment was preceded by eleven reports on the affairs of India by the Committee of the House of Commons, and the articles of impeachment were nearly as voluminous. Probably no question which has ever come before Parliament has received so thorough an examination. Hardly less important was the report of the Committee of the Commons, which consisted of the managers of the impeachment, on the Lord's journals. This was an elaborate examination of the rules of evidence which govern proceedings in the trial of impeachments, or of persons guilty of malfeasance in office. This has long been a bone of contention between lawyers and statesmen. The peers in the course of the trial had taken the opinion of the judges frequently, and had followed it in deciding on the admissibility of evidence, a great deal of which was important to the prosecution. The report maintained, and with apparently unanswerable force, that when a legislature sits on offenses against the state, it constitutes a grand inquest which makes its own rules of evidence, and is not and ought not to be tied up by the rules administered in the ordinary law courts, and formed, for the most part, for the guidance of the unskilled and often uneducated men who compose juries. As a manual for the instruction of legislative committees of inquiry, it is therefore still very valuable, if it be not a final authority. Burke, during and after the Warren Hastings trial, fell into considerable neglect and unpopularity. His zeal in the prosecution had grown as the public interest in it declined until it approached the point of fanaticism. He took office in the coalition which succeeded the Fox Whigs, and when the French Revolution broke out it found him somewhat broken in nerves irritated by his failures, and in less cordial relations with some of his old friends and colleagues. He at once arrayed himself fiercely against the revolution, and broke finally with what might be called the liberty of all parties and creeds, and stood forth to the world as the foremost champion of authority, prescription, and precedent. Probably none of his writings are so familiar to the general public as those which this crisis produced, such as The Thoughts on the French Revolution and The Letters on a Regicide Peace. They are, and will always remain, apart from the splendor of the rhetoric, extremely interesting as the last words spoken by a really great man on behalf of the old order, old Europe made through him the best possible defense of itself. He told, as no one else could have told it, the story of what customs, precedent, prescription, and established usage had done for its civilization, and he told it nevertheless as one who was the friend of rational progress, and had taken no small part in promoting it. Only one other writer who followed him came near equaling him as a defender of the past, and that was Joseph de Mestre, but he approached the subject mainly from the religious side. To him, the old regime was the order of providence. To Burke, it was the best scheme of things that humanity could devise for the advancement and preservation of civilization. In the papers we have mentioned, which were the great literary sensations of Burke's day, everything that could be said for the system of political ethics under which Europe had lived for a thousand years was said with a vigor, incisiveness, and wealth of illustration which must make them for all time and in all countries the arsenal of those who love the ancient ways and dread innovation. The failure of the proceedings against Warren Hastings, and the strong sympathy with the French Revolution, at least in its beginning, displayed by the Whigs and by most of those with whom Burke had acted in politics, had an unfortunate effect on his temper. He broke off his friendship with Fox and others of his oldest associates and greatest admirers. He became hopeless and out of conceit with the world around him. One might have set down some of this at least to the effect of advancing years and declining health, if such onslaughts on revolutionary ideas as his Reflections on the French Revolution and his Letters on a Regicide Peace 
did not reveal the continued possession of all the literary qualities which had made the success of his earlier works their faults are literally the faults of youth the brilliancy of the rhetoric the heat of the invective the violence of the partisanship the reluctance to admit the existence of any grievances in france to justify the popular onslaught on the monarchy the noblesse and the church his one explanation of the crisis and its attendant horrors was the instigation of the spirit of evil the effect on contemporary opinion was very great and did much to stimulate the conservative reaction in england which carried on the napoleonic wars and lasted down to the passage of the reform bill in eighteen thirty two there were however other causes for the cloud which came over burke's later years in spite of his great services to his party and his towering eminence as an orator and writer he never obtained a seat in the cabinet the paymastership of the forces at a salary of twenty thousand dollars a year was the highest reward either in honor or money which his party ever bestowed on him it is true that in those days the whigs were very particular in reserving high places for men of rank and family in fact their government was from the revolution of sixteen eighty eight on a thorough oligarchy divided among a few great houses that they should not have broken through this rule in burke's case and admitted to the cabinet a man to whom they owed so much as they did to him excited wonder in his own day and has down to our own time been one of the historical mysteries on which the students of that period loved to expend their ingenuity it is difficult to reconcile this exclusion and neglect of burke with the unbounded admiration lavished on him by the aristocratic leaders of the party it is difficult too to account for burke's quiet acquiescence in what seems to be their ingratitude there had before his time been no similar instance of party indifference to such claims as he could well make on such honors and rewards as the party had to bestow the most probable explanation of the affair is the one offered by his latest and ablest biographer mr john morley burke had entered public life without property probably the most serious mistake if in his case it can be called a mistake which an english politician can commit it is a wise and salutary rule of english public life that a man who seeks a political career shall qualify for it by pecuniary independence it would hardly be fair in burke's case to say that he had sought a political career the greatness of his talents literally forced it on him he became a statesman and a great parliamentary orator so to speak in spite of himself but he must have early discovered the great barrier to complete success created by his poverty he may be said to have passed his life in pecuniary embarrassment this alone might not have shut him out from the whig official paradise for the same thing might have been said of pitt and fox but they had connections they belonged by birth and association to the whig class burke's relatives were no help or credit to him in fact they excited distrust of him they offended the fastidious aristocrats with whom he associated and combined with his impecuniousness to make him seem unsuitable for a great place these aristocrats were very good to him they lent him money freely and settled a pension on him and covered him with social adulation but they were never willing to put him beside themselves in the government his latter years therefore had an air of tragedy he was unpopular with most of those who in his earlier years had adored him and was the hero of those whom in earlier years he had despised his only son of whose capacity he had formed a strange misconception died young and he passed his own closing hours as far as we can judge with a sense of failure but he left one of the great names in english history there is no trace of him in the statute book but he has it is safe to say exercised a profound influence in all succeeding legislation both in england and america he has inspired or suggested nearly all the juridical changes which distinguish the england of today from the england of the last century 
and is probably the only british politician whose speeches and pamphlets made for immediate results have given him immortality end of section seven section eight of library of the world's best literature ancient and modern volume seven this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox.org recording by bruce peary library of the world's best literature ancient and modern volume seven by various authors section eight from the speech on conciliation with america by edmund burke sir it is not a pleasant consideration but nothing in the world can read so awful and so instructive a lesson as the conduct of the ministry in this business upon the mischief of not having large and liberal ideas in the management of great affairs never have the servants of the state looked at the whole of your complicated interests in one connected view they have taken things by bits and scraps some at one time and one pretense and some at another just as they pressed without any sort of regard to their relations or dependencies they never had any kind of system right or wrong but only invented occasionally some miserable tale for the day in order meanly to sneak out of difficulties into which they had proudly strutted and they were put to all these shifts and devices full of meanness and full of mischief in order to pilfer piecemeal a repeal of an act which they had not the generous courage when they found and felt their error honorably and fairly to disclaim by such management by the irresistible operation of feeble counsels so paltry a sum as threepence in the eyes of a financier so insignificant an article as tea in the eyes of a philosopher have shaken the pillars of a commercial empire that circled the whole globe do you forget that in the very last year you stood on the precipice of general bankruptcy your danger was indeed great you were distressed in the affairs of the east india company and you well know what sort of things are involved in the comprehensive energy of that significant appellation i am not called upon to enlarge to you on that danger which you thought proper yourselves to aggravate and to display to the world with all the parade of indiscreet declamation the monopoly of the most lucrative trades and the possession of imperial revenues had brought you to the verge of beggary and ruin such was your representation such in some measure was your case the vent of ten millions of pounds of this commodity now locked up by the operation of an injudicious tax and rotting in the warehouses of the company would have prevented all this distress and all that series of desperate measures which you thought yourselves obliged to take in consequence of it america would have furnished that vent which no other part of the world can furnish but america where tea is next to a necessary of life and where the demand grows upon the supply i hope our dear bought east india committees have done us at least so much good as to let us know that without a more extensive sale of that article our east india revenues and acquisitions can have no certain connection with this country it is through the american trade of tea that your east india conquests are to be prevented from crushing you with their burden they are ponderous indeed and they must have that great country to lean upon or they tumble upon your head it is the same folly that has lost you at once the benefit of the west and of the east this folly has thrown open folding doors to contraband and will be the means of giving the profits of the trade of your colonies to every nation but yourselves never did a people suffer so much for the empty words of a preamble it must be given up for on what principles does it stand this famous revenue stands at this hour on all the debate as a description of revenue not as yet known in all the comprehensive but too comprehensive vocabulary of finance a preambulary tax it is indeed a tax of sophistry a tax of pedantry a tax of disputation a tax of war and rebellion a tax for anything but benefit to the imposers or satisfaction to the subject 
could anything be a subject of more just alarm to america than to see you go out of the plain high road of finance and give up your most certain revenues and your clearest interests merely for the sake of insulting your colonies no man ever doubted that the commodity of tea could bear an imposition of threepence but no commodity will bear threepence or will bear a penny when the general feelings of men are irritated and two millions of people are resolved not to pay the feelings of the colonies were formerly the feelings of great britain theirs were formerly the feelings of mr hampton when called upon for the payment of twenty shillings would twenty shillings have ruined mr hampton's fortune no but the payment of half twenty shillings on the principle it was demanded would have made him a slave it is the weight of that preamble of which you are so fond and not the weight of the duty that the americans are unable and unwilling to bear it is then sir upon the principle of this measure and nothing else that we are at issue it is a principle of political expediency your act of seventeen sixty seven asserts that it is expedient to raise a revenue in america your act of seventeen sixty nine which takes away that revenue contradicts the act of seventeen sixty seven and by something much stronger than words asserts that it is not expedient it is a reflection upon your wisdom to persist in a solemn parliamentary declaration of the expediency of any object for which at the same time you make no sort of provision and pray sir let not this circumstance escape you it is very material that the preamble of this act which we wish to repeal is not declaratory of a right as some gentlemen seem to argue it it is only a recital of the expediency of a certain exercise of a right supposed already to have been asserted an exercise you are now contending for by ways and means which you confess though they were obeyed to be utterly insufficient for their purpose you are therefore at this moment in the awkward situation of fighting for a phantom a quiddity a thing that wants not only a substance but even a name for a thing which is neither abstract right nor profitable enjoyment they tell you sir that your dignity is tied to it i know not how it happens but this dignity of yours is a terrible encumbrance to you for it has of late been ever at war with your interest your equity and every idea of your policy show the thing you contend for to be reason show it to be common sense show it to be the means of attaining some useful end and then i am content to allow it what dignity you please but what dignity is derived from the perseverance in absurdity is more than ever i could discern the honourable gentleman has said well indeed in most of his general observations i agree with him he says that this subject does not stand as it did formerly oh certainly not every hour you continue on this ill-chosen ground your difficulties thicken on you and therefore my conclusion is remove from a bad position as quickly as you can the disgrace and the necessity of yielding both of them grow upon you every hour of your delay to restore order and repose to an empire so great and so distracted as ours is merely in the attempt an undertaking that would ennoble the flights of the highest genius and obtain pardon for the efforts of the meanest understanding struggling a good while with these thoughts by degrees i felt myself more firm i derived at length some confidence from what in other circumstances usually produces timidity i grew less anxious even from the idea of my own insignificance for judging of what you are by what you ought to be i persuaded myself that you would not reject a reasonable proposition because it had nothing but its reason to recommend it on the other hand being totally destitute of all shadow of influence natural or adventitious i was very sure that if my proposition were futile or dangerous if it were weakly conceived or improperly timed there was nothing exterior to it of power to awe dazzle or delude you you will see it just as it is and you will treat it just as it deserves 
The proposition is peace. Not peace through the medium of war, not peace to be hunted through the labyrinth of intricate and endless negotiations, not peace to arise out of universal discord fomented from principle in all parts of the empire, not peace to depend on the juridical determination of perplexing questions or the precise marking of the shadowy boundaries of a complex government. It is simple peace, sought in its natural course and in its ordinary haunts. It is peace sought in the spirit of peace and laid in principles purely pacific. I propose, by removing the ground of the difference and by restoring the former unsuspecting confidence of the colonies in the mother country, to give permanent satisfaction to your people, and, far from a scheme of ruling by discord, to reconcile them to each other in the same act and by the bond of the very same interest which reconciles them to British government. My idea is nothing more. Refined policy ever has been the parent of confusion and ever will be so as long as the world endures. Plain good intention, which is as easily discovered at the first view as fraud is surely detected at last, is, let me say, of no mean force in the government of mankind. Genuine simplicity of heart is an healing and cementing principle. My plan, therefore, being formed upon the most simple grounds imaginable, may disappoint some people when they hear it. It has nothing to recommend it to the pruriency of curious ears. There is nothing at all new and captivating in it. It has nothing of the splendor of the project which has been lately laid upon your table by the noble lord in the blue ribbon. It does not propose to fill your lobby with squabbling colony agents who will require the interposition of your mace at every instant to keep the peace amongst them. It does not institute a magnificent auction of finance where captivated provinces come to general ransom by bidding against each other until you knock down the hammer and determine a proportion of payments beyond all the powers of algebra to equalize and settle. The plan which I shall presume to suggest derives, however, one great advantage from the proposition and registry of that noble lord's project. The idea of conciliation is admissible. First, the House, in accepting the resolution moved by the noble lord, has admitted, notwithstanding the menacing front of our address, notwithstanding our heavy bills of pains and penalties, that we do not think ourselves precluded from all ideas of free grace and bounty. The House has gone further. It has declared conciliation admissible previous to any submission on the part of America. It has even shot a good deal beyond that mark, and has admitted that the complaints of our former mode of exerting the right of taxation were not wholly unfounded. That right, thus exerted, is allowed to have something reprehensible in it, something unwise or something grievous, since, in the midst of our heat and resentment, we of ourselves have proposed a capital alteration, and in order to get rid of what seemed so very exceptionable, have instituted a mode that is altogether new, one that is indeed wholly alien from all the ancient methods and forms of Parliament. The principle of this proceeding is large enough for my purpose. The means proposed by the noble lord for carrying his ideas into execution, I think indeed are very indifferently suited to the end, and this I shall endeavour to show you before I sit down. But for the present I take my ground on the admitted principle. I mean to give peace. Peace implies reconciliation, and where there has been a material dispute, reconciliation does in a manner always imply concession on the one part or on the other. In this state of things I make no difficulty in affirming that the proposal ought to originate from us. Great and acknowledged force is not impaired, either in effect or in opinion, by an unwillingness to exert itself. The superior power may offer peace with honor and safety. Such an offer from such a power will be attributed to magnanimity. But the concessions of the weak are the concessions of fear. 
when such a one is disarmed he is wholly at the mercy of his superior and he loses forever that time and those chances which as they happen to all men are the strength and resources of all inferior power the capital leading questions on which you must this day decide are these two first whether you ought to concede and secondly what your concession ought to be on the first of these questions we have gained as i have just taken the liberty of observing to you some ground but i am sensible that a good deal more is still to be done indeed sir to enable us to determine both on the one and the other of these great questions with a firm and precise judgment i think it may be necessary to consider distinctly the true nature and the peculiar circumstances of the object which we have before us because after all our struggle whether we will or not we must govern america according to that nature and to those circumstances and not according to our own imaginations nor according to abstract ideas of right by no means according to mere general theories of government the resort to which appears to me in our present situation no better than arrant trifling i shall therefore endeavour with your leave to lay before you some of the most material of these circumstances in as full and as clear a manner as i am able to state them End of section 8. Section 9 of Library of the World's Best Literature, Ancient and Modern, Volume 7. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Bruce Peary. Library of the World's Best Literature, Ancient and Modern, Volume 7, by various authors section nine from the speech on the nabob of arcot's debts by edmund burke that you may judge what chance any honorable and useful end of government has for a provision that comes in for the leavings of these gluttonous demands i must take it on myself to bring before you the real condition of that abused insulted racked and ruined country though in truth my mind revolts from it though you will hear it with horror and i confess i tremble when i think on these awful and confounding dispensations of providence i shall first trouble you with a few words as to the cause the great fortunes made in india in the beginnings of conquest naturally excited an emulation in all the parts and through the whole succession of the company's service but in the company it gave rise to other sentiments they did not find the new channels of acquisition flow with equal riches to them on the contrary the high flood tide of private emolument was generally in the lowest ebb of their affairs they began also to fear that the fortune of war might take away what the fortune of war had given wars were accordingly discouraged by repeated injunctions and menaces and that the servants might not be bribed into them by the native princes they were strictly forbidden to take any money whatsoever from their hands but vehement passion is ingenious in resources the company's servants were not only stimulated but better instructed by the prohibition they soon fell upon a contrivance which answered their purposes far better than the methods which were forbidden though in this also they violated an ancient but they thought an abrogated order they reversed their proceedings instead of receiving presents they made loans instead of carrying on wars in their own name they contrived an authority at once irresistible and irresponsible in whose name they might ravage at pleasure and being thus freed from all restraint they indulged themselves in the most extravagant speculations of plunder the cabal of creditors who have been the object of the late bountiful grant from his majesty's ministers in order to possess themselves under the name of creditors and assignees of every country in india as fast as it should be conquered inspired into the mind of the nabob of arcot then a dependent on the company of the humblest order a scheme of the most wild and desperate ambition that i believe ever was admitted into the thoughts of a man so situated first they persuaded him to consider himself as a principal member in the political system of europe 
In the next place they held out to him, and he readily imbibed, the idea of the general empire of Indostan. As a preliminary to this undertaking, they prevailed on him to propose a tripartite division of that vast country, one part to the company, another to the Marathas, and the third to himself. To himself he reserved all the southern part of the great peninsula, comprehended under the general name of the Deccan. On this scheme of their servants, the company was to appear in the Carnatic in no other light than as a contractor for the provision of armies and hire of mercenaries, for his use and under his direction. This disposition was to be secured by the nabob's putting himself under the guarantee of France, and by the means of that rival nation preventing the English forever from assuming an equality, much less a superiority, in the Carnatic. In pursuance of this treasonable project, treasonable on the part of the English, they extinguished the company as a sovereign power in that part of India, they withdrew the company's garrisons out of all the forts and strongholds of the Carnatic, they declined to receive the ambassadors from foreign courts, and remitted them to the Nabob of Arcot, they fell upon and totally destroyed the oldest ally of the company, the king of Tanjore, and plundered the country to the amount of near five million sterling. One after another, in the nabob's name, but with English force, they brought into a miserable servitude all the princes and great independent nobility of a vast country. In proportion to these treasons and violences which ruined the people, the fund of the nabob's debt grew and flourished. Among the victims to this magnificent plan of universal plunder, worthy of the heroic avarice of the projectors, you have all heard, and he has made himself to be well remembered, of an Indian chief called Hyder Ali Khan. This man possessed the western, as the company under the name of the Nabob of Arcot does the eastern, division of the Carnatic. It was among the leading measures in the design of this cabal, according to their own emphatic language, to extirpate this Hyder Ali. They declared the Nabob of Arcot to be his sovereign, and himself to be a rebel, and publicly invested their instrument with the sovereignty of the kingdom of Mysore. But their victim was not of the passive kind. They were soon obliged to conclude a treaty of peace and close alliance with this rebel at the gates of Madras. Both before and since that treaty, every principle of policy pointed out this power as a natural alliance, and on his part it was courted by every sort of amicable office. But the cabinet council of English creditors would not suffer their nabob of Arcot to sign the treaty, nor even to give to a prince at least his equal the ordinary titles of respect and courtesy. From that time forward, a continued plot was carried on within the divan, black and white, of the nabob of Arcot, for the destruction of Hyder Ali. As to the outward members of the double, or rather treble, government of Madras, which had signed the treaty, they were always prevented by some overruling influence, which they do not describe, but which cannot be misunderstood, from performing what justice and interest combined so evidently to enforce. When at length Hyder Ali found that he had to do with men who either would sign no convention, or whom no treaty and no signature could bind, and who were the determined enemies of human intercourse itself, he decreed to make the country possessed by these incorrigible and predestinated criminals a memorable example to mankind. He resolved, in the gloomy recesses of a mind capacious of such things, to leave the whole Carnatic an everlasting monument of vengeance, and to put perpetual desolation as a barrier between him and those against whom the faith which holds the moral elements of the world together was no protection. He became at length so confident of his force, so collected in his might, that he made no secret whatsoever of his dreadful resolution. Having terminated his disputes with every enemy and every rival, who buried their mutual animosities in their common detestation against the creditors of the Nabob of Arcot, he drew from every quarter whatever a savage ferocity could add to his new rudiments in the arts of destruction, 
and compounding all the materials of fury, havoc, and desolation into one black cloud, he hung for a while on the declivities of the mountains. Whilst the authors of all these evils were idly and stupidly gazing on this menacing meteor, which blackened all their horizon, it suddenly burst and poured down the whole of its contents upon the plains of the Carnatic. Then ensued a scene of woe, the like of which no eye had seen, no heart conceived, and which no tongue can adequately tell. All the horrors of war before known or heard of were mercy to that new havoc. A storm of universal fire blasted every field, consumed every house, destroyed every temple. The miserable inhabitants, flying from their flaming villages, in part were slaughtered, Others, without regard to sex, to age, to the respective rank or sacredness of function, fathers torn from children, husbands from wives, enveloped in a whirlwind of cavalry, and amidst the goading spears of drivers and the trampling of pursuing horses, were swept into captivity in an unknown and hostile land. Those who were able to evade this tempest fled to the walled cities, but escaping from fire, sword, and exile, they fell into the jaws of famine. The alms of the settlement in this dreadful exigency were certainly liberal, and all was done by charity that private charity could do, but it was a people in beggary, it was a nation which stretched out its hands for food. For months together these creatures of sufferance, whose very excess of luxury in their most plenteous days had fallen short of the allowance of our austerest fasts, silent, patient, resigned, without sedition or disturbance, almost without complaint, perished by an hundred a day in the streets of Madras. Every day seventy at least laid their bodies in the streets or on the glacis of Tanjore, and expired of famine in the granary of India. I was going to awake your justice towards this unhappy part of our fellow citizens by bringing before you some of the circumstances of this plague of hunger. Of all the calamities which beset and waylay the life of man, this comes the nearest to our heart, and is that wherein the proudest of us all feels himself to be nothing more than he is. But I find myself unable to manage it with decorum. These details are of a species of horror so nauseous and disgusting, they are so degrading to the sufferers and to the hearers, they are so humiliating to human nature itself, that on better thoughts I find it more advisable to throw a pall over this hideous object, and to leave it to your general conceptions. For eighteen months, without intermission, this destruction raged from the gates of Madras to the gates of Tanjore, and so completely did these masters in their art, Hyder Ali and his more ferocious son, absolve themselves of their impious vow, that when the British armies traversed, as they did, the Carnatic for hundreds of miles in all directions, through the whole line of their march they did not see one man, not one woman, not one child, not one four-footed beast of any description whatever. One dead, uniform silence reigned over the whole region. With the inconsiderable exceptions of the narrow vicinage of some few forts, I wish to be understood as speaking literally. I mean to produce to you more than three witnesses, above all exception, who will support this assertion in its full extent. That hurricane of war passed through every part of the central provinces of the Carnatic. Six or seven districts to the north and to the south, and those not wholly untouched, escaped the general ravage. The Carnatic is a country not much inferior in extent to England. Figure to yourself, Mr. Speaker, the land in whose representative chair you sit. Figure to yourself the form and fashion of your sweet and cheerful country, from Thames to Trent, north and south, and from the Irish to the German Sea, east and west, emptied and emboweled, may God avert the omen of our crimes, by so accomplished a desolation. Extend your imagination a little farther, and then suppose your ministers taking a survey of this scene of waste and desolation. What would be your thoughts if you should be informed 
that they were computing how much had been the amount of the excises, how much the customs, how much the land and malt tax, in order that they should charge, take it in the most favorable light, for public service, upon the relics of the satiated vengeance of relentless enemies, the whole of what England had yielded in the most exuberant seasons of peace and abundance. What would you call it? To call it tyranny sublimed into madness would be to faint an image. Yet this very madness is the principle upon which the ministers at your right hand have proceeded in their estimate of the revenues of the Carnatic, when they were providing not supply for the establishments of its protection, but rewards for the authors of its ruin. Every day you are fatigued and disgusted with this cant. The Carnatic is a country that will soon recover and become instantly as prosperous as ever. They think they are talking to innocents who will believe that by sowing of dragon's teeth men may come up ready grown and ready armed. They who will give themselves the trouble of considering, for it requires no great reach of thought, no very profound knowledge, the manner in which mankind are increased and countries cultivated, will regard all this raving as it ought to be regarded. In order that the people, after a long period of vexation and plunder, may be in a condition to maintain government, government must begin by maintaining them. Here the road to economy lies not through receipt, but through expense. And in that country nature has given no shortcut to your object. Men must propagate, like other animals, by the mouth. Never did oppression light the nuptial torch, never did extortion and usury spread out the genial bed. Does any of you think that England, so wasted, would under such a nursing attendance so rapidly and cheaply recover? But he is meanly acquainted with either England or India, who does not know that England would a thousand times sooner resume population, fertility, and what ought to be the ultimate secretion from both, revenue, than such a country as the Carnatic. The Carnatic is not, by the bounty of nature, a fertile soil. The general size of its cattle is proof enough that it is much otherwise. It is some days since I moved that a curious and interesting map, kept in the India House, should be laid before you. The India House is not yet in readiness to send it. I have therefore brought down my own copy, and there it lies for the use of any gentleman who may think such a matter worthy of his attention. It is indeed a noble map, and of noble things, but it is decisive against the golden dreams and sanguine speculations of avarice run mad. In addition to what you know must be the case in every part of the world, the necessity of a previous provision, seed, stock, capital, that map will show you that the uses of the influences of heaven itself are in that country a work of art. The Carnatic is refreshed by few or no living brooks or running streams, and it has rain only at a season, but its product of rice exacts the use of water subject to perpetual command. This is the national bank of the Carnatic, on which it must have a perpetual credit, or it perishes irretrievably. For that reason, in the happier times of India, a number, almost incredible, of reservoirs have been made in chosen places throughout the whole country. They are formed for the greater part of mounds of earth and stones, with sluices of solid masonry, the whole constructed with admirable skill and labor, and maintained at a mighty charge. In the territory contained in that map alone, I have been at the trouble of reckoning the reservoirs, and they amount to upwards of eleven hundred, from the extent of two or three acres to five miles in circuit. From these reservoirs, currents are occasionally drawn over the fields, and these watercourses again call for a considerable expense to keep them properly scoured and duly leveled. Taking the district in that map as a measure, there cannot be in the Carnatic and Tanjore fewer than ten thousand of these reservoirs of the larger and middling dimensions, 
to say nothing of those for domestic services and the uses of religious purification these are not the enterprises of your power nor in a style of magnificence suited to the taste of your minister these are the monuments of real kings who were the fathers of their people testators to a posterity which they embrace as their own these are the grand sepulchres built by ambition but the ambition of an insatiable benevolence which not contented with reining in the dispensation of happiness during the contracted term of human life had strained with all the reachings and graspings of a vivacious mind to extend the dominion of their bounty beyond the limits of nature and to perpetuate themselves through generations of generations the guardians the protectors the nourishers of mankind long before the late invasion the persons who are the objects of the grant of public money now before you had so diverted the supply of the pious funds of culture and population that everywhere the reservoirs were fallen into a miserable decay but after those domestic enemies had provoked the entry of a cruel foreign foe into the country he did not leave it until his revenge had completed the destruction begun by their avarice few very few indeed of these magazines of water that are not either totally destroyed or cut through with such gaps as to require a serious attention and much cost to re-establish them as the means of present subsistence to the people and of future revenue to the state what sir would a virtuous and enlightened ministry do on the view of the ruins of such works before them on the view of such a chasm of desolation as that which yawned in the midst of those countries to the north and south which still bore some vestiges of cultivation they would have reduced all their most necessary establishments they would have suspended the justest payments they would have employed every shilling derived from the producing to reanimate the powers of the unproductive parts while they were performing this fundamental duty whilst they were celebrating these mysteries of justice and humanity they would have told the corps of fictitious creditors whose crimes were their claims that they must keep an awful distance that they must silence their inauspicious tongues that they must hold off their profane unhallowed paws from this holy work they would have proclaimed with a voice that should make itself heard that on every country the first creditor is the plough that this original indefeasible claim supersedes every other demand this is what a wise and virtuous ministry would have done and said this therefore is what our minister could never think of saying or doing a ministry of another kind would first have improved the country and have thus laid a solid foundation for future opulence and future force but on this grand point of the restoration of the country there is not one syllable to be found in the correspondence of our ministers from the first to the last they felt nothing for a land desolated by fire sword and famine their sympathies took another direction they were touched with pity for bribery so long tormented with a fruitless itching of its palms their bowels yearned for usury that had long missed the harvest of its returning months they felt for peculation which had been for so many years raking in the dust of an empty treasury they were melted into compassion for rapine and oppression licking their dry parched unbloody jaws these were the objects of their solicitude these were the necessities for which they were studious to provide to state the country and its revenues in their real condition and to provide for those fictitious claims consistently with the support of an army and a civil establishment would have been impossible therefore the ministers are silent on that head and rest themselves on the authority of lord mccartney who in a letter to the court of directors written in the year seventeen eighty one speculating on what might be the result of a wise management of the countries assigned by the nabob of arcot rates the revenues as in time of peace at twelve hundred thousand pounds a year 
as he does those of the king of Tanjor, which had not been assigned, at four hundred and fifty. On this Lord McCartney grounds his calculations, and on this they chose to ground theirs. It was on this calculation that the ministry, in direct opposition to the remonstrances of the court of directors, have compelled that miserable enslaved body to put their hands to an order for appropriating the enormous sum of four hundred and eighty thousand pounds annually as a fund for paying to their rebellious servants a debt contracted in defiance of their clearest and most positive injunctions the authority and information of lord mccartney is held high on this occasion though it is totally rejected in every other particular of this business i believe i have the honour of being almost as old an acquaintance as any lord mccartney has a constant and unbroken friendship has subsisted between us from a very early period and i trust he thinks that as i respect his character and in general admire his conduct i am one of those who feel no common interest in his reputation yet i do not hesitate wholly to disallow the calculation of seventeen eighty one without any apprehension that i shall appear to distrust his veracity or his judgment this peace estimate of revenue was not grounded on the state of the carnatic as it then or as it had recently stood it was a statement of former and better times there is no doubt that a period did exist when the large portion of the carnatic held by the nabob of arcot might be fairly reputed to produce a revenue to that or to a greater amount but the whole had so melted away by the slow and silent hostilities of oppression and mismanagement that the revenues sinking with the prosperity of the country had fallen to about eight hundred thousand pounds a year even before an enemy's horse had imprinted his hoof on the soil of the carnatic from that view and independently of the decisive effects of the war which ensued sir eyre coote conceived that years must pass before the country could be restored to its former prosperity and production it was that state of revenue namely the actual state before the war which the directors have opposed to lord mccartney's speculation they refused to take the revenues for more than eight hundred thousand pounds in this they are justified by lord mccartney himself who in a subsequent letter informs the court that his sketch is a matter of speculation it supposes the country restored to its ancient prosperity and the revenue to be in a course of effective and honest collection if therefore the ministers have gone wrong they were not deceived by lord mccartney they were deceived by no man the estimate of the directors is nearly the very estimate furnished by the right honourable gentleman himself and published to the world in one of the printed reports of his own committee but as soon as he obtained his power he chose to abandon his account no part of his official conduct can be defended on the ground of his parliamentary information End of section nine Section ten of Library of the World's Best Literature Ancient and Modern Volume seven. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Bruce Peary. Library of the World's Best Literature Ancient and Modern Volume seven by various authors. Section ten. From the Speech on the French Revolution by Edmund Burke when ancient opinions and rules of life are taken away the loss cannot possibly be estimated from that moment we have no compass to govern us nor can we know distinctly to what port we steer europe undoubtedly taken in a mass was in a flourishing condition the day on which your revolution was completed how much of that prosperous state was owing to the spirit of our old manners and opinions is not easy to say but as such causes cannot be indifferent in their operation we must presume that on the whole their operation was beneficial we are but too apt to consider things in the state in which we find them 
without sufficiently adverting to the causes by which they have been produced and possibly may be upheld nothing is more certain than that our manners our civilization and all the good things which are connected with manners and with civilization have in this european world of ours depended for ages upon two principles and were indeed the result of both combined i mean the spirit of a gentleman and the spirit of religion the nobility and the clergy the one by profession the other by patronage kept learning in existence even in the midst of arms and confusions and whilst governments were rather in their causes than formed learning paid back what it received to nobility and to priesthood and paid it with usury by enlarging their ideas and by furnishing their minds happy if they had all continued to know their indissoluble union and their proper place happy if learning not debauched by ambition had been satisfied to continue the instructor and not aspired to be the master along with its natural protectors and guardians learning will be cast into the mire and trodden down under the hoofs of a swinish multitude if as i suspect modern letters owe more than they are always willing to own to ancient manners so do other interests which we value full as much as they are worth even commerce and trade and manufacture the gods of our economical politicians are themselves perhaps but creatures are themselves but effects which as first causes we choose to worship they certainly grew under the same shade in which learning flourished they too may decay with their natural protecting principles with you for the present at least they threaten to disappear together where trade and manufactures are wanting to a people and the spirit of nobility and religion remains sentiment supplies and not always ill supplies their place but if commerce and the arts should be lost in an experiment to try how well a state may stand without these old fundamental principles what sort of a thing must be a nation of gross stupid ferocious and at the same time poor and sordid barbarians destitute of religion honor or manly pride possessing nothing at present and hoping for nothing hereafter i wish you may not be going fast and by the shortest cut to that horrible and disgustful situation already there appears a poverty of conception a coarseness and vulgarity in all the proceedings of the assembly and of all their instructors their liberty is not liberal their science is presumptuous ignorance their humanity is savage and brutal it is not clear whether in england we learned those grand and decorous principles and manners of which considerable traces yet remain from you or whether you took them from us but to you i think we trace them best you seem to me to be gentis incunabula nostri france has always more or less influenced manners in england and when your fountain is choked up and polluted the stream will not run long or not run clear with us or perhaps with any nation this gives all europe in my opinion but too close and connected a concern in what is done in france excuse me therefore if i have dwelt too long on the atrocious spectacle of the sixth of october seventeen eighty nine or have given too much scope to the reflections which have arisen in my mind on occasion of the most important of all revolutions which may be dated from that day i mean a revolution in sentiments manners and moral opinions as things now stand with everything respectable destroyed without us and an attempt to destroy within us every principle of respect one is almost forced to apologize for harboring the common feelings of men why do i feel so differently from the reverend dr price and those of his lay flock who will choose to adopt the sentiments of his discourse for this plain reason because it is natural i should because we are so made as to be affected at such spectacles with melancholy sentiments upon the unstable condition of mortal prosperity and the tremendous uncertainty of human greatness because in those natural feelings we learn great lessons because in events like these our passions instruct our reason 
because when kings are hurled from their thrones by the supreme director of this great drama and become the objects of insult to the base and of pity to the good we behold such disasters in the moral as we should a miracle in the physical order of things we are alarmed into reflection our minds as it has long since been observed are purified by terror and pity our weak unthinking pride is humbled under the dispensations of a mysterious wisdom some tears might be drawn from me if such a spectacle were exhibited on the stage i should be truly ashamed of finding in myself that superficial theatric sense of painted distress whilst i could exult over it in real life with such a perverted mind i could never venture to show my face at a tragedy people would think the tears that garrick formerly or that siddons not long since have extorted from me were the tears of hypocrisy i should know them to be the tears of folly indeed the theatre is a better school of moral sentiments than churches where the feelings of humanity are thus outraged poets who have to deal with an audience not yet graduated in the school of the rights of men and who must apply themselves to the moral constitution of the heart would not dare to produce such a triumph as a matter of exaltation there where men follow their natural impulses they would not bear the odious maxims of a machiavellian policy whether applied to the attainment of monarchical or democratic tyranny they would reject them on the modern as they once did on the ancient stage where they could not bear even the hypothetical proposition of such wickedness in the mouth of a personated tyrant though suitable to the character he sustained no theatric audience in athens would bear what has been borne in the midst of the real tragedy of this triumphal day a principal actor weighing as it were in scales hung in a shop of horrors so much actual crime against so much contingent advantage and after putting in and out weights declaring that the balance was on the side of the advantages they would not bear to see the crimes of new democracy posted as in a ledger against the crimes of old despotism and the bookkeepers of politics finding democracy still in debt but by no means unable or unwilling to pay the balance in the theatre the first intuitive glance without any elaborate process of reasoning will show that this method of political computation would justify every extent of crime they would see that on these principles even where the very worst acts were not perpetrated it was owing rather to the fortune of the conspirators than to their parsimony in the expenditure of treachery and blood they would soon see that criminal means once tolerated are soon preferred they present a shorter cut to the object than through the highway of the moral virtues justifying perfidy and murder for public benefit public benefit would soon become the pretext and perfidy and murder the end until rapacity malice revenge and fear more dreadful than revenge could satiate their insatiable appetites such must be the consequences of losing in the splendor of these triumphs of the rights of men all natural sense of wrong and right but the reverend pastor exults in this leading in triumph because truly louis the sixteenth was an arbitrary monarch that is in other words neither more nor less than because he was louis the sixteenth and because he had the misfortune to be born king of france with the prerogatives of which a long line of ancestors and a long acquiescence of the people without any act of his had put him in possession a misfortune it has indeed turned out to him that he was born king of france but misfortune is not crime nor is indiscretion always the greatest guilt i shall never think that a prince the acts of whose reign were a series of concessions to his subjects who was willing to relax his authority to remit his prerogatives to call his people to a share of freedom not known perhaps not desired by their ancestors 
such a prince though he should be subjected to the common frailties attached to men and to princes though he should have once thought it necessary to provide force against the desperate designs manifestly carrying on against his person and the remnants of his authority though all this should be taken into consideration i shall be led with great difficulty to think he deserves the cruel and insulting triumph of paris and of dr price i tremble for the cause of liberty from such an example to kings i tremble for the cause of humanity in the unpunished outrages of the most wicked of mankind but there are some people of that low and degenerate fashion of mind that they look up with a sort of complacent awe and admiration to kings who know how to keep firm in their seat to hold a strict hand over their subjects to assert their prerogative and by the awakened vigilance of a severe despotism to guard against the very first approaches of freedom against such as these they never elevate their voice deserters from principle listed with fortune they never see any good in suffering virtue nor any crime in prosperous usurpation if it could have been made clear to me that the king and queen of france those i mean who were such before the triumph were inexorable and cruel tyrants that they had formed a deliberate scheme for massacring the national assembly i think i have seen something like the latter insinuated in certain publications i should think their captivity just if this be true much more ought to have been done but done in my opinion in another manner the punishment of real tyrants is a noble and awful act of justice and it has with truth been said to be consolatory to the human mind but if i were to punish a wicked king i should regard the dignity in avenging the crime justice is grave and decorous and in its punishments rather seems to submit to a necessity than to make a choice had nero or agrippina or louis the eleventh or charles the ninth been the subject if charles the twelfth of sweden after the murder of patkul or his predecessor christina after the murder of monaldeschi had fallen into your hands sir or into mine i am sure our conduct would have been different if the french king or king of the french or by whatever name he is known in the new vocabulary of your constitution has in his own person and that of his queen really deserved these unavowed but unavenged murderous attempts and those frequent indignities more cruel than murder such a person would ill deserve even that subordinate executory trust which i understand is to be placed in him nor is he fit to be called chief in a nation which he has outraged and oppressed a worse choice for such an office in a new commonwealth than that of a deposed tyrant could not possibly be made but to degrade and insult a man as the worst of criminals and afterwards to trust him in your highest concerns as a faithful honest and zealous servant is not consistent with reasoning nor prudent in policy nor safe in practice those who could make such an appointment must be guilty of a more flagrant breach of trust than any they have yet committed against the people as this is the only crime in which your leading politicians could have acted inconsistently i conclude that there is no sort of ground for these horrid insinuations i think no better of all the other calumnies in england we give no credit to them we are generous enemies we are faithful allies we spurn from us with disgust and indignation the slanders of those who bring us their anecdotes with the attestation of the flower de luce on their shoulder we have lord george gordon fast in newgate and neither his being a public proselyte to judaism nor his having in his zeal against catholic priests and all sorts of ecclesiastics raised a mob excuse the term it is still in use here which pulled down all our prisons have preserved to him a liberty of which he did not render himself worthy by a virtuous use of it we have rebuilt newgate and tenanted the mansion we have prisons almost as strong as the bastille for those who dare to libel the queens of france in this spiritual retreat let the noble libeller remain let him there meditate on his talmud 
until he learns a conduct more becoming his birth and parts and not so disgraceful to the ancient religion to which he has become a proselyte or until some persons from your side of the water to please your new hebrew brethren shall ransom him he may then be enabled to purchase with the old hordes of the synagogue and a very small poundage on the long compound interest of the thirty pieces of silver dr price has shown us what miracles compound interest will perform in one thousand seven hundred and ninety years the lands which are lately discovered to have been usurped by the gallican church send us your popish archbishop of paris and we will send you our protestant rabbin we shall treat the person you send us in exchange like a gentleman and an honest man as he is but pray let him bring with him the fund of his hospitality bounty and charity and depend upon it we shall never confiscate a shilling of that honourable and pious fund nor think of enriching the treasury with the spoils of the poor box to tell you the truth my dear sir i think the honour of our nation to be somewhat concerned in the disclaimer of the proceedings of this society of the old jewry and the london tavern i have no man's proxy i speak only for myself when i disclaim as i do with all possible earnestness all communion with the actors in that triumph or with the admirers of it when i assert anything else as concerning the people of england i speak from observation not from authority but i speak from the experience i have had in a pretty extensive and mixed communication with the inhabitants of this kingdom of all descriptions and ranks and after a course of attentive observation begun early in life and continued for nearly forty years i have often been astonished considering that we are divided from you but by a slender dyke of about twenty-four miles and that the mutual intercourse between the two countries has lately been very great to find how little you seem to know of us i suspect that this is owing to your forming a judgment of this nation from certain publications which do very erroneously if they do at all represent the opinions and dispositions generally prevalent in england the vanity restlessness petulance and spirit of intrigue of several petty cabals who attempt to hide their total want of consequence in bustle and noise and puffing and mutual quotation of each other makes you imagine that our contemptuous neglect of their abilities is a mark of general acquiescence in their opinions no such thing i assure you because half a dozen grasshoppers under a fern make the field ring with their importunate chink whilst thousands of great cattle reposed beneath the shadow of the british oak chew the cud and are silent pray do not imagine that those who make the noise are the only inhabitants of the field that of course they are many in number or that after all they are other than the little shrivelled meagre hopping though loud and troublesome insects of the hour end of section ten section eleven of library of the world's best literature ancient and modern volume seven this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox dot org library of the world's best literature ancient and modern volume seven by various authors section eleven at the pit from that lass of lorries by francis hodgson burnett the next morning derrick went down to the mine as usual there were several things he wished to do in these last two days he had heard that the managers had entered into negotiations with a new engineer and he wished the man to find no half-done work the day was bright and frosty and the sharp bracing air seemed to clear his brain he felt more hopeful and less inclined to view matters darkly he remembered afterward that as he stepped into the cage he turned to look at the unpicturesque little town brightened by the winter's sun, and that as he went down he glanced up at the sky, and marked how intense appeared the bit of blue which was framed in by the mouth of the shaft. Even in the few hours that had elapsed since the meeting, the rumor of what he had said and done had been brooded about. Some collier had heard it and had told it to his comrades, and so it had gone from one to the other. It had been talked over at the evening and morning meal in divers cottages, 
and many an anxious hand had warmed into praise of the man who had had a thought for the men. In the first gallery he entered, he found a deputation of men awaiting him, a group of burly miners with picks and shovels over their shoulders, and the head of this deputation, a spokesman burlier and generally gruffer than the rest, stopped him. Mester, he said, we chaps would like to have a word with you. All right, was Derek's reply. I'm ready to listen. The rest crowded nearer, as if anxious to participate as much as possible, and give their spokesman the support of their presence. It is now mitch as we had gotten to say, said the men, but we're fairin' to say it. Are now we mates? Ay, we are, lad, in chorus. It's about someone as we heard. There were a chap as told some on us last need as you had gotten a sack for the mar- managers, or at least a ways as you had turned the tables on em and given them the sack your sin. And we heard as it begun when you're standin' up for us chaps, askin' for things as were wanted in the pit to save us from running more risk than we need. And we heard as you spoke up bold and argued for us and stood to what you thought were the reet thing, and that we set our minds on tellin' you as we heard it and talked it over, and we'd like to say a word of thanks a comin' for the pluck you showed. Is now that it, mates? Aye, that it is, lad, responded the chorus. Suddenly one of the group stepped out and threw down his pick. And I'm dumbed, mates, he said, if here is now a chap as I'd like to shake hands with him. It was the signal for the rest to follow his example. They crowded about their champion, thrusting grimy paws into his hand, grasping it almost enthusiastically. Good luck to you, lad, said one. We known smooth sort of chaps, but we stand by what's fair and plucky. We shall have a good word for thee when thou hast made thy flittin'. I am glad of that, lads, responded Derek heartily, by no means unmoved by the rough and ready spirit of the scene. I only wish I had had better luck, that's all. A few hours later, the whole of the little town was shaken to its very foundations by something like an earthquake, accompanied by an ominous booming sound which brought people flocking out of their houses with white faces. Some of them had heard it before. All knew what it meant. From the colliers' cottages poured forth women, shrieking and wailing, women who bore children in their arms and had older ones dragging at their skirts, and who made their desperate way to the pit with one accord. From houses and workshops there rushed men, who, coming out in twos and threes, joined each other, and, forming a breathless crowd, ran through the streets scarcely daring to speak a word, and all ran toward the pit. There were scores at its mouth in five minutes, in ten minutes there were hundreds, and above all the clamor rose the cry of women. My mester's down, and mine, and mine. Four lads of mine is down, three of mine. My little one's there, the youngest, no but ten-year-old, no but ten-year-old, poor little chap, and only been at work a week. Ay, wenches, God have mercy on us all, God have mercy. And then more shrieks and wails in which the terror-stricken children joined. It was a fearful sight. How many lay dead and dying in the noisome darkness below, God only knew. How many lay mangled and crushed, waiting for their death, heaven only could tell. In five minutes after the explosion occurred, a slight figure in clerical garb made its way through the crowd with an air of excited determination. The parson's fear, was the general comment. My men, he said, raising his voice so that all could hear, can any of you tell me who last saw Fergus Derrick? There was a brief pause, and then came a reply from a collier who stood near. I come up out of the pit an hour ago, he said. I were the last as come up, and it were only chance as brought me. Derrick were with his men in the new part of the mine. I seed him as I passed through. Grace's face became a shade or so paler, but he made no more inquiries. His friend either lay dead below, or was waiting for his doom at that very moment. He stepped a little further forward. Unfortunately for myself at present, he said, I have no practical knowledge of the nature of these accidents. Will some of you tell me how long it will be before we can make our first effort to rescue the men who were below? Did he mean to volunteer, this young whippersnapper of a parson? And if he did, could he know what he was doing? I ask you, he said, because I wish to offer myself as a volunteer at once. I think I am stronger than you imagine, and at least my heart will be in the work. I have a friend below, myself, his voice altering its tone and losing its firmness. 
a friend who is worthy the sacrifice of ten such lives as mine, if such a sacrifice could save him. One or two of the older and more experienced spoke up. Under an hour it would be impossible to make the attempt. It might even be a longer time, but in an hour they might at least make their first effort. If such was the case, the parson said, the intervening period must be turned to the best account. In that time much could be thought of and done which would assist themselves and benefit the sufferers. He called upon the strongest and most experienced, and almost without their recognizing the prominence of his position, led them on in the work. He even rallied the weeping women and gave them something to do. One was sent for this necessary article, and another for that. A couple of boys were dispatched to the next village for extra medical assistance, so that there need be no lack of attention when it was required. He took off his broadcloth and worked with the rest of them until all the necessary preparations were made, and it was considered possible to descend into the mine. When all was ready, he went to the mouth of the shaft and took his place quietly. It was a hazardous task they had before them. Death would stare them in the face all through its performance. There was choking after damp below, noxious vapors, to breathe which was to die. There was a chance of crushing masses falling from the shaking galleries, and yet these men left their companions one by one and ranged themselves without saying a word at the curate's side. "'My friends,' said Grace, bearing his head and raising a feminine hand, "'my friends, we will say a short prayer.' It was only a few words. Then the curate spoke again. Ready, he said. But just at that moment there stepped out from the anguished crowd a girl, whose face was set and deathly, though there was no touch of fear upon it. I asks you, she said, to let me go with you and do what I can. Lasses, some on you speak a word for Joan Lowry. There was a breathless start. The women even stopped their outcry to look at her as she stood apart from them a desperate appeal in the very quiet of her gesture as she turned to look about her for someone to speak. Lasses, she said again, some on you speak a word for Joan Lowry. There rose a murmur from among them, and the next instant this murmur was a cry. Aye, they answered, we can all speak for you. Let her go, lads. She's worth two of the best on you. Not fears her. Aye, she mun go if she will, mun Joan Lowry. Go, Joan Lass, and we not forget thee. But the men demurred. The finer instinct of some of them shrank from giving a woman a place in such a perilous undertaking. The coarser element in others rebelled against it. We had no wenches, these said surlily. Grace stepped forward. He went to Joan Lowry and touched her gently on the shoulder. We cannot think of it, he said. It is very brave and generous, and God bless you, but it cannot be so. I could not think of allowing it myself, if the rest would. Parson, said Joan, coolly but not roughly, thou'd had hard work to help thy sin, if so be as the lads were willin'. But, he protested, it may be death. I could not bear the thought of it. You are a woman. We cannot let you risk your life. She turned to the volunteers. Lads, she cried passionately, yo ma not turn me back. I, sin I mun tell you, and she faced them like a queen. There's a mon down near as I'd give my heart's blood to save. They did not know whom she meant, but they demurred no longer. Take thy place, wench, said the oldest. If thou mun, thou mun. She took her seat in the cage by grace, and when she took it she half turned her face away. But when those above began to lower them, and they found themselves swinging downward into what might be to them a pit of death, she spoke to him. There's a prayer I'd like you to pray, she said. Pray that if we mun dee, we may not dee until we had done our work. It was a dreadful work indeed that the rescuers had to do in those black galleries. And Joan was the bravest, quickest, most persistent of all. Paul Grace, following in her wake, found himself obeying her slightest word or gesture. He worked constantly at her side, for he at least had guessed the truth. He knew that they were both engaged in the same quest. When at last they had worked their way, lifting, helping, comforting, to the end of the passage where the collier had said he last saw the master, then for one moment she paused, and her companion with a thrill of pity touched her to attract her attention. "'Let me go first, he said. "'Nay,' she answered, "'we go together.' The gallery was a long and low one, and had been terribly shaken. In some places the props had been torn away, 
in others they were borne down by the loosened blocks of coal the dim light of the davy joan held up showed such a wreck that grace spoke to her again you must let me go first he said with gentle firmness if one of these blocks should fall joan interrupted him if one on em should fall i'm the one as it had better fall on there is na money folk as ad miss joan lawry yo ha your own work to do she stepped into the gallery before he could protest and he could only follow her she went before holding the davy high so that its light might be thrown as far forward as possible now and then she was forced to stoop to make her way around a bending prop sometimes there was the falling mass to be surmounted but she was at the front still when they reached the other end without finding the object of their search he is now there she said let us try the next passage and she turned into it it was she who first came upon what they were looking for but they did not find it in the next passage or the next or even the next it was farther away from the scene of the explosion than they had dared to hope as they entered a narrow side gallery grace heard her utter a low sound and the next minute she was down upon her knees there's a man here she said it's him as we're looking for she held the dim little lantern close to the face a still face with closed eyes and blood upon it grace knelt down too his heart aching with dread is he he began but could not finish joan lowry laid her hand upon the apparently motionless breast and waited almost a minute and then she lifted her own face white as the wounded man's white and solemn and wet with a sudden rain of tears he is not dead she said we have saved him she sat down on the floor of the gallery and lifting his head laid it upon her bosom holding it close as a mother might hold the head of her child mester she said give me the brandy flask and take thou thy davy and go for some of the men to help us get him to the lead a day i'm gone weak at last i cannot do no more i'll go win to the top when the cage ascended to the mouth again with its last load of sufferers joan lowry came with it blinded and dazzled by the golden winter sunlight as it fell upon her haggard face she was holding the head of what seemed to be a dead man upon her knee a great shout of welcome rose up from the bystanders she helped them to lay her charge upon a pile of coats and blankets prepared for him and then she turned to the doctor who had hurried to the spot to see what could be done he is not dead she said lay your hand upon his heart it beats yet mister only a little but it beats no said the doctor he is not dead yet with a breath's pause between the two last words if some of you will help me to put him on a stretcher he may be carried home and i will go with him there is just a chance for him poor fellow and he must have immediate attention where does he live he must go with me said grace he is my friend so they took him up and joan stood a little apart and watched them carry him away watched the bearers until they were out of sight and then turned again and joined the women in their work among the sufferers End of section 11. Recording by Karen Renee. Section 12 of Library of the World's Best Literature, Ancient and Modern, Volume 7. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Reading by Matt Perard. Library of the World's Best Literature, Ancient and Modern, Volume 7, by Various Authors, Section 12. Selected Excerpts from Evelina by Francis Burney, Madame de Arblay, 1752-1840. There is a suggestion of the ugly duckling story in Fanny Burney's early life. The personality of this shy little girl, who was neither especially pretty nor precocious, was rather merged in the half-dozen of gayer brothers and sisters. The first eight years of her life were passed at Lynn Regis in Norfolk. Then the family moved to London, where her father continued his career as an important writer on music and a fashionable music master. Soon after, Mrs. Burney died. All the children but young Fanny were sent away to school. She was to have been educated at home, but received little attention from the learned, kind, but heedless Dr. Burney, who seems to have 
considered her the dull member of his plot. Poor Fanny, he often said, until her sudden fame overwhelmed him with surprise as well as exultation. Only his friend, her beloved Daddy Crisp of the letters, appreciated her, himself a disappointed dramatic author, soured by what he felt to be an incomprehensible failure yet a fine critical talent with kind and wise suggestions for his favorite fanny but while her book education was of the slightest her social advantages were great pleasure-loving dr burney had a delightful faculty of attracting witty and musical friends to enliven his home fanny's great unnoticed gift was power of observation the shy girl who avoided notice herself found her social pleasure in watching and listening to clever people perhaps a gallic strain for her mother was of french descent gave her clear-sightedness she had a turn for social satire which added humorous discrimination to her judgments she understood people better than books and perceived their petty hypocrisies self-deceptions and conventional standards with witty good sense and love of sincerity years of this silent note-taking and personal intercourse with brilliant people gave her unusual knowledge of the world she was a docile girl ready always to heed her father and her daddy crisp ready to obey her kindly stepmother and try to exchange for practical occupations her pet pastime of scribbling but from the time she was ten she had loved to write down her impressions and the habit was too strong to be more than temporarily renounced like many imaginative persons she was fond of carrying on serial inventions in which repressed fancies found expression one long story she destroyed but the characters haunted her and she began a sequel which became evelina in the young beautiful virtuous heroine with her many mortifying experiences and her ultimate triumph she may have found compensation for a starved vanity of her own for a long time she and her sisters enjoyed evelina's tribulations then fanny grew ambitious and encouraged by her brother thought of publication when she tremblingly asked her father's consent he carelessly countenanced the venture and gave it no second thought after much negotiation a publisher offered twenty pounds for the manuscript and in seventeen seventy eight the appearance of evelina ended fanny burney's obscurity for a long time the book was the topic of boundless praise and endless discussion everyone wondered who could have written the clever story which was usually attributed to a society man the great dr johnson was enthusiastic insisted upon knowing the author and soon grew very fond of his little fanny he introduced her to his friends and she became the celebrity of a delightful circle sir joshua reynolds and burke sat up all night to finish evelina the thrales madame delaney who later introduced her at court sheridan gibbon and sir walter scott were among those who admired her most cordially it was a happy time for fanny encouraged to believe her talent far greater than it was she wrote a drama which was read in solemn judgment by her father and daddy crisp who decided against it as too like les Précieux ridicules a play she had never read a second novel cecilia appeared in seventeen eighty two and was as successful as its predecessor later readers find it less spontaneous and after it she never resumed her early style except in her journal and correspondence her ambition was fully astir she had every incentive from her family and friends but the old zest and composition had departed the self-consciousness which had always tormented her in society seized her now when she was trying to cater to public taste and made her change her frank free personal expression for a stilted artificial formality of phrase her reputation was now at its height and she was very happy in her position as society favorite and pride of the father whom she had always passionately admired when she made the mistake of her life 
Urged by her father, she accepted a position at court as second keeper of the queen's robes. There she spent five pleasureless and worse than profitless years. In her diary and letters, the most readable today of all her works, she has told the story of wretched discomfort, of stupidly uncongenial companionship, of arduous tasks made worse by the selfish thoughtlessness of her superiors. She has also given our best historical picture of that time, the everyday life at court, the slow agony of King George's increasing insanity. But the drudgery and mean hardships of the place and the depression of being separated from her family broke down her health, and after much opposition, she was allowed to resign in 1791. Soon afterwards, she astonished her friends by marrying General d'Arblay, a French officer and a gentleman, although very poor. As the pair had an income of only 100 pounds, this seems a perilously rash act for a woman over 40. Fortunately, the match proved a very happy one, and the situation stimulated Madame Diable to renewed authorship. Camilla, her third novel, was sold by subscription and was a very remunerative piece of work. But from a critical point of view, it was a failure, and being written in a heavy pedantic style is quite deficient in her early charm. With the proceeds, she built a modest home, Camilla Cottage. Later, the family moved to France, where her husband died and where her only son received his early education. When he was nearly ready for an English university, she returned to England and passed her tranquil age among her friends until she died at 88. What Fanny Burney did in all unconsciousness was to establish fiction upon a new basis. She may be said to have created the family novel. Fielding, Smollett, and Stern had bequeathed their legacy impregnated with objectionable qualities in spite of strength and charm. They were read rather secretly and tabooed for women. On the other hand, the followers of Richardson were too didactic to be readable. Fanny Burney proved that entertaining tales, unweighted by heavy moralizing, may be written, adapted to young and old. Her sketches of life were witty, sincere, and vigorous, yet always moral in tone. Evelina, the work of an innocent Frank girl, could be read by anyone. A still greater source of her success was her robust and abounding, though sometimes rather broad and cheap, fun. In her time, decent novels were apt to be appallingly serious in tone and not infrequently stupid. Humor, in spite of Addison, still connoted much coarseness and obtrusive sexuality, and in fiction had to be sought in the novels written for men only. As humor is the deadly foe to sentimentalism and hysterics, the Richardson school were equally averse to it on further grounds. Fanny Burney produced novels fit for women's and family reading, yet full of humor of a masculine vigor, and it must be added with something of masculine unsensitiveness. There is little fineness to most of it. Some is mere horseplay. Some is extravagant farce, but it is deep and genuine. It supplied an exigent want and deserved its welcome. De Morgan says it was like introducing dresses of glaring red and yellow and other crude colors into a country where everyone had previously dressed in drab. A great relief, but not art. This is hard measure, however. Some of her character drawing is almost as richly humorous and valid as Jane Austen's own. Fanny Burney undoubtedly did much to augment the new respect for women's intellectual ability and was a stimulus to the brilliant group which succeeded her. Miss Barrier, Maria Edgeworth, and Jane Austen all owe her something of their inspiration and more of their welcome. Evelina's Letter to the Reverend Mr. Villars from Evelina Holborn, June 17th. 
Yesterday, Mr. Smith carried his point of making a party for Vauxhall, consisting of Madame Duval, Monsieur Dubois, all the Brantons, Mr. Brown, himself, and me, for I find all endeavors vain to escape anything which these people desire I should not. There were twenty disputes previous to our setting out, first as to the time of our going. Mr. Branton, his son, and young Brown were for six o'clock, and all the ladies and Mr. Smith were for eight. The latter, however, conquered then as to the way we should go some were for a boat others for a coach and mr branton himself was for walking but the boat at length was decided upon indeed this was the only part of the expedition that was agreeable to me for the thames was delightfully pleasant the garden is very pretty but too formal i should have been better pleased had it consisted less of straight walks where grove nods at grove each alley has its brother the trees the numerous lights and the company in the circle round the orchestra make a most brilliant and gay appearance and had i been with a party less disagreeable to me i should have thought it a place formed for animation and pleasure there was a concert in the course of which a hautbois concerto was so charmingly played that i could have thought myself upon enchanted ground had I had spirits more gentle to associate with, the old blood in the open air is heavenly. Mr. Smith endeavored to attach himself to me with such officious assiduity and impertinent freedom that he quite sickened to me. Indeed, Monsieur Dubois was the only man of the party to whom voluntarily I ever addressed myself. He is civil and respectful and i have found nobody else so since i left howard grove his english is very bad but i prefer it to speaking french myself which i dare not venture to do i converse with him frequently both to disengage myself from others and to oblige madame duval who is always pleased when he is attended to as we were walking about the orchestra i heard a bell ring and in a moment Mr. Smith, flying up to me, caught my hand, and, with a motion too quick to be resisted, ran away with me many yards before I had breath to ask his meaning, though I struggled as well as I could to get from him. At last, however, I insisted upon stopping. Stopping, ma'am, cried he. Why, we must run on, or we shall lose the cascade. And then again he hurried me away mixing with the crowd of people, all running with so much velocity that I could not imagine what had raised such an alarm. We were soon followed by the rest of the party, and my surprise and ignorance proved a source of diversion to them, all which was not exhausted the whole evening. Young Branton, in particular, laughed till he could hardly stand. The scene of the cascade I thought extremely pretty and the general effect striking and lively but this was not the only surprise which was to divert them at my expense for they led me about the garden purposely to enjoy my first sight of various other deceptions about ten o'clock mr smith having chosen a box in a very conspicuous place we all went to supper much fault was found with everything that was ordered though not a morsel of anything was left and the dearness of the provisions with conjectures upon what profit was made by them supplied discourse during the whole meal when wine and cider were brought mr smith said now let's enjoy ourselves now is the time or never well ma'am and how do you like fox hall like it cried young branton why how can she help liking it she has never seen such a place before that i'll answer to for my part said miss branton i like it because it is not vulgar this must have been a fine treat for you miss said mr branton why i suppose you was never so happy in all your life before i endeavoured to express my satisfaction with some pleasure yet i believe they were much amazed at my coldness miss ought to stay in town till the last night said young branton and then it's my belief she'd say something to it 
why lord it's the best night of any there's always a riot and there the folks run about and then there's such squealin and squallin and there are all the lamps are broke and the women run skimper scamper i declare i would not take five guineas to miss the last night i was very glad when they all grew tired of sitting and called for the waiter to pay the bill the miss Branktons said they would walk on while the gentlemen settled the account and asked me to accompany them which however i declined you girls may do as you please said madame duval but as to me i promise you i shan't go nowhere without the gentlemen no more i suppose will my cousin said miss branton looking reproachfully towards mr smith this reflection which i feared would flatter his vanity made me most unfortunately request madame duval's permission to attend them then she granted it and away we went having promised to meet in the room to the room therefore i would immediately have gone but the sisters agreed that they would first have a little pleasure and they tittered and talked so loud that they attracted universal notice lord pauling said the eldest suppose we were to take a turn in the dark walks i do answered she and then we'll hide ourselves and then mr brown will think we are lost i remonstrated very warmly against this plan telling them it would endanger our missing the rest of the party all the evening oh dear cried miss branton i thought how uneasy miss would be without a bow this impertinence i did not think worth answering and quite by compulsion i followed them down a long alley in which there was hardly any light by the time we came near the end a large party of gentlemen apparently very riotous and who were hallooing leaning on one another and laughing immoderately seemed to rush suddenly from behind some trees and meeting us face to face put their arms at their sides and formed a kind of circle which first stopped our proceeding and then our retreating for we were presently entirely enclosed the miss Brantons screamed aloud and i was frightened exceedingly our screams were answered with bursts of laughter and for some minutes we were kept prisoners till at last one of them rudely seizing hold of me said i was a pretty little creature terrified to death i struggled with such vehemence to disengage myself from him that i succeeded in spite of his efforts to detain me and immediately and with a swiftness which fear only could have given me i flew rather than ran up the walk hoping to secure my safety by returning to the lights and company we had so foolishly left but before i could possibly accomplish my purpose i was met by another party of men one of whom placed himself directly in my way calling out whither so fast my love so that i could only have proceeded by running into his arms in a moment both my hands by different persons were caught hold of and one of them in a most familiar manner desired when i ran next to accompany me in a race while the rest of the party stood still and laughed i was almost distracted with terror and so breathless with running that i could not speak till another advancing said i was as handsome as an angel and desired to be of the party i then just articulated for heaven's sake gentlemen let me pass another then rushing suddenly forward exclaimed heaven and earth what voice is that the voice of the prettiest little actress i have seen in sage answered one of my persecutors no 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 i panted out i am no actress pray let me go pray let me pass by all that's sacred cried the same voice which i then knew for sir clement willoughby's tis herself a man of the time from cecilia at the door of the pantheon they were joined by mr onot and sir robert floyer whom cecilia now saw with added aversion they entered the great room during the second act of the concert to which as no one of the party but herself had any desire to listen no sort of attention was paid 
the ladies entertaining themselves as if no orchestra was in the room and the gentlemen with an equal disregard of it struggling for a place by the fire about which they continued hovering till the music was over soon after they were seated mr meadows sauntering towards them whispered something to mrs mears who immediately rising introduced him to cecilia after which the place next to her being vacant he cast himself upon it and lolling as much at his ease as his situation would permit began something like a conversation with her have you been long in town ma'am no sir this is not your first winter of being in town it is then you have something new to see oh charming how i envy you are you pleased with the pantheon very much i have seen no building at all equal to it you have not been abroad travelling is the ruin of all happiness there's no looking at a building here after seeing italy does all happiness then depend upon sight of buildings said cecilia when turning towards her companion she perceived him yawning with such evident inattention to her answer that not choosing to interrupt his reverie she turned her head another way for some minutes he took no notice of this and then as if suddenly recollecting himself he called out hastily i beg your pardon ma'am you were saying something no sir nothing worth repeating oh pray don't punish me so severely as not to let me hear it cecilia though merely not to seem offended at his negligence was then beginning an answer when looking at him as she spoke she perceived that he was biting his nails with so absent an air that he appeared not to know he had asked any question she therefore broke off and left him to his cogitation some time after he addressed her again saying don't you find this place extremely tiresome ma'am yes sir said she half laughing it is indeed not very entertaining nothing is entertaining answered he for two minutes together things are so little different one from another that there is no making pleasure out of anything we go the same dull round for ever nothing new no variety all the same thing over again are you fond of public places ma'am yes sir soberly as lady grace says that i envy you extremely for you have some amusement always in your own power how desirable that is and have you not the same resources oh no i am tired to death tired of everything i would give the universe for a disposition less difficult to please yet after all what is there to give pleasure when one has seen one thing one has seen everything oh tis heavy work don't you find it so ma'am the speech was ended with so violent a fit of yawning that cecilia would not trouble herself to answer it but her silence as before passed unnoticed exciting neither question nor comment a long pause now succeeded which he broke at last by saying as he writhed himself about upon his seat these forms would be much more agreeable if there were backs to them tis intolerable to be forced to sit like a schoolboy the first study of life is ease there is indeed no other study that pays the trouble of attainment don't you think so ma'am but may not even that said cecilia by so much study become labour i am vastly happy you think so sir i beg your pardon ma'am but i thought you said i really beg your pardon but i was thinking of something else you did very right sir said cecilia laughing for what i said by no means merited any attention will you do me the favour to repeat it cried he taking out his glass to examine some lady at a distance oh no said cecilia that would be trying your patience too severely these glasses shew one nothing but defects said he i am sorry they were ever invented they are the ruin of all beauty no complexion can stand them i believe that solo will never be over i hate a solo it sinks it depresses me intolerably you will presently sir said cecilia looking at the bill of the concert 
have a full piece, and that I hope will revive you. A full piece? Oh, unsupportable. It stuns, it fatigues, it overpowers me beyond endurance. No taste in it, no delicacy, no room for the smallest feeling. Perhaps, then, you are only fond of singing? I should be, if I could hear it, but we are now so miserably off in voices that I hardly ever attempt to listen to a song. Without fancying myself deaf from the feebleness of the performers, I hate everything that requires attention. Nothing gives pleasure that does not force its own way. You only, then, like loud voices and great powers. Oh, worse and worse. No, nothing is so disgusting to me. All my amazement is that these people think it worthwhile to give concerts at all. One is sick to death of music. Nay, cried Cecilia, if it gives no pleasure, at least it takes none away. For, far from being any impediment to conversation, I think everybody talks more during the performance than between the acts. And what is there better you could substitute in its place? Cecilia, receiving no answer to this question, again looked round to see if she had been heard, when she observed her new acquaintance, with a very thoughtful air, had turned from her to fix his eyes upon the statue of Britannia. Very soon after, he hastily arose, and, seeming entirely to forget that he had spoken to her, very abruptly walked away. Mr. Gosport who was advancing to cecilia and had watched part of the scene stopped him as he was retreating and said why meadows how's this are you caught at last oh worn to death worn to a thread cried he stretching himself and yawning i have been talking with a young lady to entertain her oh such heavy work i would not go through it again for millions what have you talked yourself out of breath no but the effort the effort Oh, it has unhinged me for a fortnight, entertaining a young lady. One had better be a galley slave at once. Well, but does she not pay your toils? She is surely a sweet creature. Nothing can pay one for such insufferable exertion, though she's well enough, too, better than the common run, but shy, quite too shy, no drawing her out. I thought that was to your taste. You commonly hate much volubility. How have I heard you bemoan yourself when attacked by Miss Larolles? Larolles? Oh, distraction. She talks me into a fever in two minutes. But so it is for ever. Nothing but extremes to be met with. Common girls are too forward. This lady is too reserved. Always some fault. Always some drawback. Nothing ever perfect. Nay, nay cried Mr. Gosbard. You do not know her. She is perfect enough in all conscience. Better not know her, then, answered he, again yawning, for she cannot be pleasing. Nothing perfect is natural. I hate everything out of nature. Miss Burney's Friends From the Letters but Dr. Johnson's approbation, it almost crazed me with agreeable surprise. It gave me such a flight of spirits that I danced a jig to Mr. Crisp without any preparation, music, or explanation, to his no small amazement and diversion. I left him, however, to make his own comments upon my friskiness without affording him the smallest assistance. Susan also writes me word that when my father went last to Streatham, Dr. Johnson was not there, but Mrs. Thrale told him that when he gave her the first volume of Evelina, which she had lent him, he said, Why, madam, why, what a charming book you lent me, and eagerly inquired for the rest. He was particularly pleased with the Snow Hill scenes, and said that Mr. Smith's vulgar gentility was admirably portrayed and when Sir Clement joins them, he said there was a shade of character prodigiously well marked. Well may it be said that the greatest minds are ever the most candid to the inferior set. I think I should love Dr. Johnson for such lenity to a poor mere worm in literature, even if 
I were not myself the identical grub he has obliged. Susan has sent me a little note, which has really been less pleasant to me, because it has alarmed me for my future concealment. It is from Mrs. Williams, an exceedingly pretty poetess, who has the misfortune to be blind, but who has, to make some amends, the honor of residing in the house of Dr. Johnson. For though he lives almost wholly at Stratum, he always keeps his apartments in town, and this lady acts as mistress of his house. July 25. Mrs. Williams sends compliments to Dr. Burney, and begs he will intercede with Miss Burney to do her the favor to lend her the rating of Evelina. Though I am frightened at this affair, I am by no means insensible to the honor which I receive from the certainty that Dr. Johnson must have spoken very well of the book to have induced Mrs. Williams to send to our house for it. I now come to last Saturday evening, when my beloved father came to Chesington, in full health, charming spirits, and all kindness, openness, and entertainment. In his way hither he had stopped at Streatham, and he settled with Mrs. Thrale that he would call on her again in his way to town, and carry me with him. And Mrs. Thrale said, We all long to know her. I have been in a kind of twitter ever since, for there it seems something very formidable in the idea of appearing as an authoress i ever dreaded it as it is a title which must raise more expectations than i have any chance of answering yet i am highly flattered by her invitation and highly delighted in the prospect of being introduced to the stratum society she sent me some very serious advice to write for the theatre as she says I so naturally run into conversations that Evelina absolutely and plainly points out that path to me, and she hinted how much she should be pleased to be honored with my confidence. My dear father communicated this intelligence, and a great deal more, with a pleasure that almost surpassed that with which I heard it, and he seems quite eager for me to make another attempt. He desired to take upon himself the communication to my daddy crisp, and as it is now, in so many hands that it is possible accident might discover it to him, I readily consented. Sunday evening, as I was going into my father's room, I heard him say, The variety of characters, the variety of scenes, and the language, why, she has had very little education, but what she has given herself, less than any of the others and Mr. Crisp exclaimed, Wonderful! It's wonderful! I now found what was going forward, and therefore deemed it most fitting to decamp. About an hour after, as I was passing through the hall, I met my daddy, Crisp. His face was all animation and archness. He doubled his fist at me, and would have stopped me, but I ran past him into the parlor. Before supper, however, I again met him, and he would not suffer me to escape. He caught both of my hands, and looked as if he would have looked me through, and then exclaimed, Why, you little hussy, you young devil, ain't you ashamed to look me in the face, you, Evelina, you? Why, what a dance have you let me about it? Young friend, indeed, oh, you little hussy, what tricks have you served me? I was obliged to allow of his running on with these gentle appellations, for I know not how long, ere he could sufficiently compose himself, after his great surprise, to ask or hear any particulars, and then he broke out every three instants with exclamations of astonishment at how I had found time to write so much unexpected and how and where I had picked up such various materials, and not a few times did he, with me, as he had with my father, exclaim, Wonderful! He has since made me read him all my letters upon the subject. He said loans would have made an estate had he given me one thousand pounds for it, and that he ought not to have given less. You have nothing to do now, continued he, but to take your pen in hand, for your fame and reputation are made, and any bookseller will snap at what you write. I then told him that I could not, but really, 
and unaffectedly regret that the affair was spread to mrs williams and her friends Fo, said he if those who are proper judges think it right that it should be known why should you trouble yourself about it you have not spread it there can be no imputation of vanity fall to your share and it cannot come out more to your honour than though such a channel as mrs thrale london august i have now to write an account of the most consequential day i have spent since my birth namely my stratum visit our journey to stratum was the least pleasant part of the day for the roads were dreadfully dusty and i was really in the fidgets from thinking what my reception might be and from fearing they would expect a less awkward and backward kind of person than i was sure they would find mr thrale's house is white and very pleasantly situated in a fine paddock mrs thrale was strolling about and came to us as we got out of the chaise she then received me taking both my hands and with and with mixed politeness and cordiality welcoming me to stratham she led me into the house and addressed herself almost wholly for a few minutes to my father as if to give me an assurance she did not mean to regard me as a show or to distress or frighten me by drawing me out afterwards she took me upstairs and showed me the house and said she had very much wished to see me at stratham and should always think herself much obliged to dr burney for his goodness in bringing me which she looked upon as a very great favour but though we were some time together and though she was so very civil she did not hint at my book and i love her much more than ever for her delicacy in avoiding a subject which she could not but see would have greatly embarrassed me when we returned to the music-room we found miss thrale was with my father miss thrale is a very fine girl about fourteen years of age but cold and reserved though full of knowledge and intelligence soon after mrs thrale took me to the library she talked a little while upon common topics and then at last she mentioned evelina yesterday at supper said she we talked it all over and discussed all your characters but dr johnson's favourite is mr smith he declares the fine gentleman Mac, was never better drawn and he acted him all the evening saying he was all for the ladies he repeated whole scenes by heart i declare i was astonished at him oh you can't imagine how much he is pleased with the book he could not get rid of the road he told me but was it not droll said she that i should recommend it to dr burney and tease him so innocently to read it i now prevailed upon mrs thrale to let me amuse myself and she went to dress i then prowled about to choose some book and i saw upon the reading-table evelina i had just fixed upon a new translation of cicero's lelius when the library door was opened and mr seward entered i instantly put away my book because i dreaded being thought studious and affected he offered his service to find anything for me and then in the same breath ran on to speak of the book with which i had myself favoured the world the exact words he began with i cannot recollect for i was actually confounded by the attack and his abrupt manner of letting me know he was au fait equally astonished and provoked me how different from the delicacy of mr and mrs thrale when we were summoned to dinner mrs thrale made my father and me sit on each side of her i said that i hoped i did not take dr johnson's place for he had not yet appeared no answered mrs thrale he will sit by you which i am sure will give him great pleasure soon after we were seated this great man entered i have so true a veneration for him that the very sight of him inspires me with delight and reverence notwithstanding the cruel infirmities to which he is subject for he has almost perpetual convulsive movements either of his hands lips feet or knees and sometimes of all together mrs thrale introduced me to him and he took his place we had a noble dinner and a most elegant dessert dr johnson in the middle of dinner asked mrs thrale 
what was in some little pies that were near him. Mutton, answered she, so I don't ask you to eat any, because I know you despise it. No, madam, no, cried he, I despise nothing that is good of its sort, but I am too proud now to eat of it. Sitting by Miss Burney makes me very proud today. Miss Burney, said Mrs. Thrale, laughing, you must take great care of your heart if Dr. Johnson attacks it, for I assure you he is not often successless. What's that you say, madam? cried he. Are you making mischief between the young lady and me already? A little while after he drank Mrs. Thrale's health and mine, and then added, "'Tis a terrible thing that we cannot wish young ladies well "'without wishing them to become old women. "'But some people,' said Mr. Seward, "'are old and young at the same time, "'for they wear so well that they never look old.' "'No, sir, no,' cried the doctor, laughing. "'That never yet was. "'You might as well say they are at the same time tall and short.' End of section 12. Section 13 of Library of the World's Best Literature, Ancient and Modern, Volume 7. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Tony Addison. Library of the World's Best Literature, Ancient and Modern, Volume 7, by various authors. Section 13. Selected Excerpts from Cecilia and the Letters, by Francis Burney, Madame D'Arblay. A Man of the Turn, from Cecilia. At the door of the Pantheon, they were joined by Mr. Arnott and Sir Robert Floyer, whom Cecilia now saw with added aversion. They entered the great room during the second act of the concert, to which, as no one of the party but herself had any desire to listen, no sort of attention was paid, the ladies entertaining themselves as if no orchestra was in the room, and the gentlemen, with an equal disregard to it, struggling for a place by the fire, about which they continued hovering, till the music was over. Soon after they were seated, Mr. Meadows, sauntering towards them, whispered something to Mrs. Mears, who, immediately rising, introduced him to Cecilia, after which, the place next to her being vacant, he cast himself upon it, and, lolling as much at his ease as his situation would permit, began something like a conversation with her. "'Have you been long in town, ma'am?' "'No, sir. This is not your first winter?' "'Of being in town it is. Then you have something new to see. Oh, charming, how I envy you. Are you pleased with the Pantheon? Very much. I have seen no building at all equal to it. You have not been abroad. Travelling is the ruin of all happiness. There's no looking at a building here after seeing Italy. Does all happiness, then, depend upon sight of buildings? said Cecilia, when, turning towards her companion, she perceived him yawning 
with such evident inattention to her answer that, not choosing to interrupt his reverie, she turned her head another way. For some minutes he took no notice of this, and then, as if suddenly recollecting himself, he called out hastily, I beg your pardon, mum, you were saying something? No, sir, nothing worth repeating. Oh, pray don't punish me so severely as to not to let me hear it. Cecilia, though merely not to seem offended at his negligence, was then beginning an answer. When looking at him as she spoke, she perceived that he was biting his nails with so absent an air that he appeared not to know he had asked any question. She therefore broke off and left him to his cogitation. Some time after he addressed her again, saying, "'Don't you find this place extremely tiresome, mom? "'Yes, sir,' said she, half laughing. "'It is indeed not very entertaining.' "'Nothing is entertaining,' answered he, "'for two minutes together.' <laughs> Things are so little different one from another that there is no making pleasure out of anything. We go the same dull round for ever. Nothing new, no variety, all the same thing over again. Are you fond of public places, ma'am? Yes, sir, soberly, as Lady Grace says. Then I envy you extremely, for you have some amusement always in your own power. How desirable that is! And have you not the same resources? Oh, no, I am tired to death, tired of everything. I would give the universe for a disposition less difficult to please. Yet, after all, what is there to give pleasure? When one has seen one thing, one has seen everything. Oh, tis heavy work. Don't you find it so, Mom? This speech was ended with so violent a fit of yawning that Cecilia would not trouble herself to answer it, but her silence as before passed unnoticed, exciting neither question nor comment. A long pause now succeeded, which he broke at last by saying as he writhed himself about upon his seat, these forms would be much more agreeable if there were bags to them. Tis intolerable to be forced to sit like a schoolboy. The first study of life is ease. There is indeed no other study that pays the trouble of attainment. Don't you think so, Mom? But may not even that, said Cecilia, by so much study, become labour? I am vastly happy, you think so? Sir? I beg your pardon, ma'am, but I thought you said... 
I really beg your pardon, but I was thinking of something else. You did very right, sir, said Cecilia, laughing, for what I said by no means merited any attention. Will you do me the favour to repeat it? cried he, taking out his glass to examine some lady at a distance. Oh, no, said Cecilia, that would be trying your patience too severely. These glasses show one nothing but defect, said he. I am sorry they were ever invented. They are the ruin of all beauty. No complexion can stand them. I believe that a solo will never be over. I hate a solo. It sings. It depresses me intolerably. You will presently, sir, said Cecilia, looking at the bill of the concert, have a full piece, and that, I hope, will revive you. A full piece! Oh, insupportable! It stuns, it fatigues, it overpowers me, beyond endurance. No taste in it, no delicacy, no room for the smallest feeling. Perhaps, then, you are only fond of singing. I should be, if I could hear it. But we are now so miserably off in voices that I hardly ever attempt to listen to a song without fancying myself deaf from the feebleness of the performers. I hate everything that requires attention. Nothing gives pleasure that does not force its own way. You only then like loud voices and great powers. Oh, worst and worst, no, nothing is so disgusting to me. All my amazement is that these people think it worth while to give concerts at all, one is sick to death of music. Nay, cried Cecilia, if it gives no pleasure, at least it takes none away, for far from being any impediment to conversation, I think everybody talks more during the performance than between the acts. And what is there better who could substitute in its place? A Cecilia receiving no answer to this question, again looked round to see if she had been heard, when she observed her new acquaintance, with a very thoughtful air, had turned from her to fix his eyes upon the statue of Britannia. Very soon after, he hastily arose, and seeming entirely to forget that he had spoken to her, very abruptly, walked away. Mr. Gosport, who was advancing to Cecilia, and had watched part of this scene, stopped him as he was retreating, and said, Why, Meadows, how's this? Are you caught at last? Oh, worn to death, worn to a thread, cried he, stretching himself and yawning. I have been talking with a young lady to entertain her. Oh, such heavy work. I would not go through it again for millions. What, have you talked yourself out of breath? No, but the effort, the effort. 
Oh, it has unhinged me for a fortnight. Entertaining a young lady, one had better be a galley slave at once. Well, but did she not pay your toils? She is surely a sweet creature. Nothing can pay one for such insufferable exertion, though she is well enough too, better than the common rum, but shy, quite too shy, no drawing her out. I thought that was to your taste. You commonly hate much volubility. How have I heard you bemoan yourself when attacked by Miss Larolles? Oh, Larolles, oh, distraction! She talks me into a fever in two minutes. But so it is for ever. Nothing but extremes to be met with. Common girls are too forward. This lady is too reserved. Always some fault. Always some drawback. Nothing ever perfect. Nay, nay, cried Mr. Gosport. You do not know her. She is perfect enough in all conscience. Better not know her, then, answered he, again yawning. For she cannot be pleasing. Nothing perfect is natural. I hate everything out of nature. <laughs> Miss Burney's Friends From the Letters but Dr. Johnson's approbation, it almost crazed me with agreeable surprise. It gave me such a flight of spirits that I danced a jig to Mr. Crisp without any preparation, music, or explanation. To his no small amazement and diversion, I left him, however, to make his own comments upon my friskiness without affording him the smallest assistance. Susan also writes me word that when my father went last to Streatham, Dr. Johnson was not there, but Mrs. Thrale told him that when he gave her the first volume of Ebelina, which she had lent him, he said, Why, madam, why, what a charming book you lent me, and eagerly inquired for the rest. He was particularly pleased with the Snow Hill scenes, and said that Mr. Smith's vulgar gentility was admirably portrayed, and when Sir Clement joins them, he said there was a shade of character prodigiously well marked. Well may it be said that the greatest minds are ever the most candid to the inferior set. I think I should love Dr. Johnson, for such lenity to a poor mere worm in literature, even if I were not myself the identical grub he is obliged. Susan has sent me a little note, which has really been less pleasant to me, because it has alarmed me for my future concealment. It is from Mrs. Williams, an exceeding pretty poetess, who has the misfortune to be blind, but who has to make some amends the honour of residing in the house of Dr. Johnson, for, though he lives almost wholly at Streatham, he always keeps his apartments in town, and this lady acts as mistress of his house. July 25th Mrs. Williams sends compliments to Dr. Burney, and begs he will intercede with Miss Burney, to do her the favour to lend her the reading of Evelina. Though I am frightened at this affair, I am by no means insensible to the honour which I receive from the certainty that Dr. Johnson must have spoken very well of the book, to have induced Mrs. Williams to send to our house for it. I now come to last Saturday evening, 
when my beloved father came to Chesington, in full health, charming spirits, and all kindness, openness, and entertainment. In his way hither he had stopped at Streatham, and he settled with Mrs. Thrale that he would call on her again in his way to town, and carry me with him. And Mrs. Thrale said, We all long to know her. I have been in a kind of twitter ever since, for there seems something very formidable in the idea of appearing as an authoress. I ever dreaded it, as it is a title which must raise more expectations than I have any chance of answering. Yet I am highly flattered by her invitation, and highly delighted in the prospect of being introduced to the Streatham Society. She sent me some very serious advice to write for the theatre, as she says I so naturally run into conversations that Evelina absolutely and plainly points out that path to me, and she hinted how much she should be pleased to be honoured with my confidence. My dear father communicated this intelligence, and a great deal more, with a pleasure that almost surpassed that with which I heard it, and he seems quite eager for me to make another attempt. He desired to take upon himself the communication to my Daddy Crisp, and as it is now in so many hands that it is possible accident might discover it to him, I readily consented. Sunday evening, as I was going into my father's room, I heard him say, The variety of characters, the variety of scenes, and the language, why she has had very little education but what she has given herself, less than any of the others. And Mr. Crisp exclaimed, Wonderful! It's wonderful! I now found what was going forward and therefore deemed it most fitting to decamp. About an hour after, as I was passing through the hall, I met my daddy, Crisp. His face was all animation and archness. He doubled his fist at me, and would have stopped me, but I ran past him into the parlour. Before supper, however, I again met him, and he would not suffer me to escape. He caught both my hands, and looked as if he would have looked me through, and then exclaimed, Why, you little hussy, you young devil, ain't you ashamed to look me in the face, you Evelina, you? Why, what a dance have you led me about it, young friend, indeed? Oh, you little hussy, what tricks have you served me? I was obliged to allow of his running on with these gentle appellations, for I know not how long, ere he could sufficiently compose himself, after his great surprise, to ask or hear any particulars. And then he broke out every three instants with exclamations of astonishment at how I had found time to write so much unsuspected, and how and where I had picked up such various materials. And not a few times did he, with me, as he had with my father, exclaim, Wonderful! He has since made me read him all my letters upon this subject. He said Lowndes would have made an estate had he given me one thousand pounds for it, and that he ought not to have given less. You have nothing to do now, continued he, but to take your pen in hand, for your fame and reputation are made, and any bookseller will snap at what you write. I then told him that I could not but really and unaffectedly regret that the affair was spread to Mrs. Williams and her friends. Phew, said he, if those who are proper judges think it right that it should be known, why should you trouble yourself about it? You have not spread it? There can be no imputation of vanity fall to your share, and it cannot come out more to your honour than through such a channel as Mrs. Thrale. London, August. I have now to write 
an account of the most consequential day I have spent since my birth, namely my Streatham visit. Our journey to Streatham was the least pleasant part of the day, for the roads were dreadfully dusty, and I was really in the fidgets from thinking what my reception might be, and from fearing they would expect a less awkward and backward kind of person than I was sure they would find. Mr. Thrale's house is white, and very pleasantly situated in a fine paddock. Mrs. Thrale was strolling about, and came to us as we got out of the chaise. She then received me, taking both my hands, and with mixed politeness and cordiality welcoming me to Streatham. She led me into the house, and addressed herself almost wholly for a few minutes to my father, as if to give me an assurance she did not mean to regard me as a show, or to distress or frighten me by drawing me out. Afterwards she took me upstairs and showed me the house, and said she had very much wished to see me at Streatham, and should always think herself much obliged to Dr. Burney for his goodness in bringing me, which she looked upon as a very great favour. But though we were some time together, and though she was so very civil, she did not hint at my book, and I love her much more than ever for her delicacy in avoiding a subject which she could not but see would have greatly embarrassed me. When we returned to the music-room, we found Miss Thrale was with my father. Miss Thrale is a very fine girl, about fourteen years of age, but cold and reserved, though full of knowledge and intelligence. Soon after, Mrs. Thrale took me to the library. She talked a little while upon common topics, and then at last she mentioned Evelina. Yesterday at supper, said she, we talked it all over, and discussed all your characters, but Dr. Johnson's favourite is Mr. Smith. He declares the fine gentleman Monquet was never better drawn, and he acted him all the evening, saying he was all for the ladies. He repeated whole scenes by heart. I declare I was astonished at him. Oh, you can't imagine how much he is pleased with the book. He could not get rid of the rogue, he told me. But was it not droll, said she, that I should recommend it to Dr. Burney, and tease him so innocently to read it? I now prevailed upon Mrs. Thrale to let me amuse myself, and she went to dress. I then prowled about to choose some book and I saw upon the reading-table Evelina. I had just fixed upon a new translation of Cicero's Lilius, when the library door was opened, and Mr. Seward entered. I instantly put away my book, because I dreaded being thought studious and affected. He offered his services to find anything for me, and then, in the same breath, ran on to speak of the book with which I had myself favoured the world. The exact words he began with I cannot recollect, for I was actually confounded by the attack, and his abrupt manner of letting me know he was au fait equally astonished and provoked me. How different from the delicacy of Mr. and Mrs. Thrale! When we were summoned to dinner, Mrs. Thrale made my father and me sit on each side of her. I said that I hoped I did not take Dr. Johnson's place, for he had not yet appeared. No, answered Mrs. Thrale, he will sit by you, which I am sure will give him great pleasure. Soon after we were seated, this great man entered. I have so true a veneration for him, that the very sight of him inspires me with delight and reverence, notwithstanding the cruel infirmities to which he is subject, for he has almost perpetual convulsive movements, 
either of his hands, lips, feet, or knees, and sometimes of all together. Mrs. Thrale introduced me to him, and he took his place. We had a noble dinner, and a most elegant dessert. Dr. Johnson, in the middle of the dinner, asked Mrs. Thrale what was in some little pies that were near him. Mutton, answered she, so I don't ask you to eat any, because I know you despise it. No, madam, no, cried he, I despise nothing that is good of its sort, but I am too proud now to eat of it. Sitting by Miss Burney makes me very proud to-day. Miss Burney, said Mrs. Thrale, laughing, you must take great care of your heart if Dr. Johnson attacks it, for I assure you he is not often successless. What's that you say, ma'am? cried he. Are you making mischief between the young lady and me already? A little while after he drank Miss Thrale's health and mine, and then added, "'Tis a terrible thing that we cannot wish young ladies well without wishing them to become old women. But some people, said Mr. Seward, are old and young at the same time, for they wear so well that they never look old. No, sir, no, cried the doctor, laughing. That never yet was. You might as well say they are at the same time tall and short. End of section 13